Hello. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Brand. Thank Good you. Good morning. Um, please uh, uh, have a seat. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Summers, thank you for giving evidence to the committee's inquiry into drugs. Uh, Mr. Russell Brand, you gave evidence, written evidence, to this committee, which members of the committee have read. Could I start with a a point about what you say in your evidence? that you disagree with the legalization of drugs because you think that a deterrent effect is necessary. Is that right? Um, I don't feel entirely qualified to talk about legislation. For me, what's more significant is the way that we socially regard the condition of addiction. It's something that I consider to be an illness and therefore more a health matter than a, a criminal or judicial matter. Um, I don't think that legalisation is something that I've, as I said, particularly qualified to get into. I can see areas, in fact, where decriminalisation might be considered useful and more efficient, you know, in like countries like Portugal or Switzerland, Switzerland where there's been trials. It seems to be, uh, it seems to have had s uh, some efficacy. But for me, it's more important that we regard people suffering from addiction with compassion and that there's a pragmatic rather than symbolic approach to, to treating it. And I think the legislative, legislative uh, status of addiction and the criminalisation of addicts is kind of symbolic and not really functional. I don't see how it especially helps. But I'm not saying let's have a wacky free-for-all where people go around taking drugs. Didn't mm. do me, didn't help me much. You're a former heroin addict. Yeah. Um, Briefly, could you tell us how you got onto drugs and then how you managed to come off it and how many years you were on hard drugs? I see you've incorporated the word briefly now into the question, as you've already noticed my propensity for verbosity. I became a drug addict, I think, because of emotional difficulties, psychological difficulties, and perhaps a spiritual malady. For me, taking drugs and excessive drinking were the result of a psychological, spiritual or mental condition. As, so they're symptomatic. I was like sad, lonely, unhappy, detached. And drugs and alcohol for me seemed like a solution to that problem. Once I dealt with the emotional, spiritual, mental impetus, I no, no longer felt the need to take drugs or use drugs. I got clean actually at Chip Summers is facility Focus 12, which is abstinence-based recovery. And that's what we essentially believe in, is that if you have the disease or the illness of addiction or alcoholism, the best way to tackle it is to not use drugs in any form, whether it's state-sponsored opiates like methadone or illegal street drugs or, or illegal substance like alcohol. We see no distinction between these substances. What we believe in is that abstinence-based recovery is the best solution for people suffering from this condition and the support structures exist to get people to maintain recovery, absence-based recovery. What we want is more research and funding into absence-based recovery and to be able to filter people towards this new lifestyle which actually criminalisation becomes less of an issue in my view because it takes people that have to indulge in criminal activity yes. to find their habits yes. and get them into being thank you. valuable members of society. Now you Was that brief enough? Very brief, thank you. Um, you were arrested roughly 12 times by, it was the, rough, yes. Yes, by the police um, and, and the justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that when you were arrested that you had the kind of support that you needed and people like you who were arrested being involved in drugs, the rehabilitation and the support that was needed to get you off drugs? How did the criminal justice system react to you after your arrests? From my experience speaking to people in the criminal, criminal justice system and from my own personal experience being arrested, th th there's some confusion and ignorance around addiction. And it's quite understandable because a lot of drug addicts, like speaking personally, are antisocial. They are a strain on society. They necessarily engage in criminal activity. They're a public nuisance in many ways. Uh, I felt when I was arrested that you know, the police were doing a necessary job of enforcing the laws of this country and they were doing what they had to do. But it wasn't until I had access to abstinence-based recovery that I was able to change my behaviour and significantly reduce, all but obliterate, my criminal activity, apart from the occasional skirmish. Final, final question for me on this uh, section. 
is the issue of legal highs. We've been very concerned in the evidence that we've received about the number of legal highs that are available and young people who seem to be able to take legal highs whenever they are banned or proposed to be banned, a new legal high emerges. Do you think that this is something that does affect young people? Is this now the, the, the drug of choice for young people? I don't know because I'm not young enough anymore. But I know that young people will always want to get high. And I think that what we need is a pragmatic approach to this. In a way, for me, as I said before, Keith, it's insignificant the substance that they're using, whether it's alcohol, illegal street drugs. The legal status of a drug is irrelevant to a drug addict. If you're a drug addict, you're getting drugs. That's it. You're going to get them. So it's, you know, in a way, it's probably best to make it simple. As for legal highs, what I think we need to do is address the social, mental and spiritual problems that are leading young people or people of all ages to taking drugs. And I, so I think it's a, what we need is research into abstinence-based recovery and more awareness around it. On to some of those points with other questions. Bridget Phillipson. I'm currently working on a programme about addiction and how it's viewed in society. What messages are you hoping to get across in that programme? The messages that we're hoping to get across in this programme is that maintenance of drug addiction through state-sponsored substances like methadone should only be deployed as part of a reduction with the ultimate aim of abstinence-based recovery, that we need to start reg regarding addiction in all its forms as a health issue as opposed to a judicial and criminal issue, that we need to change the laws in this country and we need to have a more compassionate, altruistic, loving attitude to the people with the disease of addiction and recognise that these people with the proper help access to the proper treatment can become active and helpful members of society, like myself, some would argue that point, or perhaps more obviously Chip <laughs> Summers, who a man with a criminal record as long as your arm now runs a treatment centre and has been like clean for 27 years. That's the message, that we don't want to discard people, we don't want to life them off on methadone and leave them on the sidelines, we need to bring them in to society, offer them treatment and, and once again uh, neutralise the toxic social threat that they offer as, as criminals because they have to fund their habit or even if, like, if it's a legal drug like alcohol they're clattering into things, driving drunk, pain in the ass people. We need to offer them treatment and activate them and incorporate them into our society. So the message is ultimately one of pragmatism, altruism and compassion in all areas of the condition. Thank you. Mr Summers, if you, we will have specific questions for you but if you want to chip in if I may put it like oh, that okay. at any stage please feel uh, free to do so but we do have is there anything you want to add? From what I you've think heard he's so doing far? splendidly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chip. Excellent. Chip Brandis runs the treatment centre where I got clean. So yes, we're coming on to him in a minute, Mr. Brand. <laughs> he's already the puppeteer behind each and every articulation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brand. Uh, Michael Ellis has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brand, you've said that addiction is an illness. Yes. Um, but would you say that it's also fair to characterise it to a large extent as self-induced? Not uh, really. Like many other illnesses. And also that um, it does ca carry with it um, victims. Many people who are on drugs uh, commit offences against other people, do they not? So it differs in that respect as well, doesn't it? And when one's looking at the criminal justice system, uh, doesn't one also have to have some compassion and consideration for the victims of crime where those crimes are committed by people under the influence of drugs? Michael, I'm very glad you've asked me that question. It's a very important question and it's one that we need to address. Of course the victims of acquisitive drug-related crimes are important and need to be taken care of. We were with uh, Chief Superintendent Graham Bartlett the other day of Sussex Police, a wonderful man, a good civic-minded gentleman. It, it's his belief that by regarding addiction as an illness, by offering treatment instead of a more punitive approach, we can, take, we, we can prevent people from committing tri crimes. Just personally, I was a criminal when I was a drug addict by virtue of my addiction and the ways that I had to acquire money to get drugs. Anecdotally, Chip was an armed robber in and out of Nick all the time. I hope you don't mind me telling them this. And, like, uh, and, and other people I've met, you know, like, criminality is a necessary component. Now, of course we're not saying forget the victims, but I'm saying it's better to address the social situation pragmatically. And I think we all know this. By prescribing methadone to people, most people on methadone are using illegal drugs to supplement their habit. They're not addressing the root problems. We need to approach, th we need to approach the victims with respect. Where there has been criminal behaviour, it needs to be dealt with correctly. But perhaps within the penal system itself, we can offer treatment to addicts, like the brilliant work that's done by RACT in various uh, institutions and prisons. 
So you don't think there needs to be a carrot and a stick, would you? I don't think there needs to be a carrot or a stick. Both of those things seem like bizarre metaphors. I think what there needs to be is love and compassion to everybody involved. You need to, if people are committing criminal behaviour, then it needs to be dealt with legally, but you need to offer them treatment, not simply out of some airy fairy that's all old hands and hug liberalism, no. but because it deals with the problem and it prevents further crimes being committed. Addicts that get clean at one day at a time through abstinence-based recovery, generally speaking, stop committing crimes. That's better for victims, it's better for the addict, it's better for society. Ellis? The, uh, the role that celebrities play in society is uh, not insignificant. And I want to ask you whether... I'd argue that it is insignificant, and well, that's why they play that role. Perhaps it, sh perhaps it should be more than it is. But what I want to know from you, Mr Brand, is whether you think that having um, got out of the cycle of addiction... Yes. And I congratulate you for, for that. Thank you. Whether you... Um, would like to position yourself as a role model in society for um, those who might look to you uh, as an example. As the great Tupac Shakur said, <clears throat> role is something people play, model is something that people make. Both of those things are fake. What I want to offer people is truth and authenticity in the treatment of this illness, in the, our regard to the criminal components of it, in assisting victims and in the way we legislate and organise our society. I, I can't be responsible, as you know, you know, you look hold committees all the time about the reprehensible be behaviour of our media. What the cipher of my image is used to represent in the media, I have no control over. You do, you do because you, your behaviour is some aspect of what's portrayed about you, isn't it? Well, yes, of course, but, uh, you know, however, how's this going to be written up? This could be written up as Michael Ellis, he's, he's sprawled on a pin there by the wit of Brand, or they could say, say the recalcitrant former drug addict rambled on. You know, if you read it in the Telegraph, it's going to say one thing. If you, if you read it in the Socialist Worker, it's going to say another thing. A combination. Of course, the, the <laughs> objective <laughs> behaviour has got components, but I'm saying that what I want to offer people is truth and authenticity, and I think celebrity, as we all know, is a vapid, vacuous, toxic concept used to distract people people from what's actually important, and in this case, that's treatment of people with a disease of addiction. Thank you. Yes, Mr Summers. Mm. Um, as far as we were concerned, those people who are brave enough, who are both celebrities and recovering addicts, have a profound effect on the number of people who seek treatment, yeah. because it gives out a very positive message that recovery is possible. And when uh, Russell Brand's book came out, the number of referrals to our treatment centre was just, you know, hugely exaggerated because people suddenly discovered that treatment was possible, help was possible and it was better and, and people could get better and it made a profound difference and I would hope that actually more people in the public eye, whether they be, well I suppose by celebrities they are in the public eye, will come forward and have the bravery to do so because it does encourage people. So celebrities can be a very positive role. Absolutely. Really. But of course then it can backfire as well when people uh, make a big uh, fuss about being in recovery and then relapse and of course that's, that, that's unfortunate but uh, we're fortunate with Russell that he's maintaining a good recovery and that continues to be a good role model. Brand, do you think more people need to know about uh, things like cocaine production, where cocaine comes from? The committee went to Colombia to look at the effects that the harvesting of cocaine was having on um, the people of Colombia who are extraordinarily poor and were forced to be involved in this kind of activity. Do you think if there was more focus on where it all came from and how it affected communities, that would help stop people getting involved. No, Keith, no more than the industrial uh, consequences of oil production affect people using their cars. People don't care about uh, like industry, people care about getting the resource that they require. The illegality makes no difference, the consequences in the nation of origin makes no difference. I think what we need is to address the emotional, mental and spiritual problems that lead to addiction. Of course, uh, the, any illegal industry or the cocaine manufacturer in South American nations or wherever has a negative consequence for their nations, but I don't think that that's something that individual drug addicts are going to be affected by, to be honest, because they're normally on drugs. Thank you very much. Lorraine Fulbrook has some questions to Mr Summers. I'd like to ask a question to Mr Summers. Uh, Focus 12 has three high-profile patrons, Mr yes. Brand, Davina McCall yep. and uh, Boy, Boy George. George. And that's something that was probably unthinkable about 50 years ago. Yes. Do you think that has led to the destigmatization of addiction, or do you think it's led to a wider acceptance of drug use in society in general? I don't think it's encouraged people to use drugs. I think there have been some people who have made a, a sort of positive. Sorry, Len. Oh, I was right in the middle of my answer then. Still a good speech, it's just got some <laughs> ladies going by. I think that 
the public oh, is oh, fine. Oh, yes, Mr. Okay. Summers. Yeah, I've completely forgotten where I was. Because she was deep, flirting with empty. It's about high-profile <laughs> patrons oh, yeah. and destigmatisation, or does it I think there are certain celebrities drinking? who have made a sort of positive um, message about drug use, which has, it has not helped the situation at all. I think most people who get better from drug addiction are a very positive influence. But I think there are some celebrities, obviously, who have probably contributed to people using drugs because they make it look glamorous, they make it look interesting, and I don't suppose that helps. But I think as long as, you see, while they're using, they will tend to do that. But if they stop using, then they obviously become a, much, a very positive role model. But I do think there are some celebrities who have made the matter worse. I don't think on a national scale it's made a huge difference. I think no. there are one or two people who are influenced who by that. About but I don't think it's... A, as, as the chief executive of Focus, I mean, yeah. do you, how do you pick your celebrities, is it, I just The ones that get clean, I'll, I'll grab them. Um, yeah. Very helpful. Nicola Blackwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on, on your work on abstinence-based um, work. I think that it's very effective, and I share your suspicion about long-term methadone um, maintenance. Um, but I was, I was struck by your comments about um, the problems of highlighting um, drug use in communities. And do you think that we're doing enough? Or do you think that there's a risk that our harm reduction um, based approaches to drugs education are giving a false impression that there are some drugs which are safe if they're used correctly? I, I think we are not doing anything like enough to give an honest answer to the problems of drugs. I think we are uh, giving a rather clouded message about drug use. I think there's a lot more that we could be doing about honestly educating people about drugs. I don't think we address it and, uh, and um, take it on board properly enough. And uh, I, yeah, I feel that we should be doing much more, especially at an educational level. We should be giving honest education. And I don't think there are many schools that are giving honest education to young people. We've been educating young people now for 15 years, and it hasn't had a major influence on the number of drug use. I think we need to change how we're doing the education of young people, particularly. Well, how? Because by I giving mean, a more honest, uh, by giving more honest information, it's no good just going into schools and saying drugs are bad, stop it. Because there, in each of those schools, there will be people who are using cannabis, <coughs> who are using ketamine, who are using ecstasy. Not all the school, but some of them will be. And if you don't give people the, the, the both the, the good and the bad of drug use, you they won't listen to you. You because there are lots of people in schools who are smoking cannabis and not dropping dead. You have to give both the positive and the negative side of it. And I don't think we're doing that. I think we're giving too much of the negative side of it and not giving honest information. Unless it's honest, people won't listen. Thank you. Dr Julian Huppert wants to... Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Summers, you're, you're an advocate for, for abstinence-based so. um, approaches. Um, you presumably know there's been work by Professor Strang, for example, published yep. in The Lancet, which um, showed that there was uh, good evidence for, for methadone maintenance and, and very high cost-effectiveness, uh, fairly good for, for heroin maintenance and a lack of evidence for abstinence. Do you think that abstinence is the answer for everybody or are you arguing that there are people for whom it is a very good option? I think it is a, an admirable aim for everybody. Not everybody can achieve it, not everybody can give up smoking. But I think uh, it is, uh, I think there's a, there's a really uh, good purpose for, for methadone usage at a certain stage. But just to park people on methadone for four to seven years and more is criminal, really. I mean, just to keep people in, locked into that addiction because it, methadone usage is a dependency, you're totally dependent. Um, I think it has a role, but I think it gets overused, and I think we just tend to use it as a, as a, as a, a response to everything, and we don't do enough to intervene. I, I think it would be an admirable aim for everybody. I don't think methadone usage is a good thing. I see very few people on methadone who are leading good, stable lives. I think most of the people who are using methadone are also using other drugs on top. If I saw it producing good stability, I would be much more in favour of it. I don't see that. What I do see is that people who are abstinent lead good, clean and decent lives, but obviously not everybody can achieve it. Uh, I think that suggests further research is needed to, to yes. check the results. Can I also just ask, really, for both of you, because obviously we have uh, finite resources to spend. If we're going to spend more money on treatment, and if we're going to spend more money on education, money has to be taken from somewhere. I and mean, one possible suggestion is that we uh, spend less money on doing the, the, the policing of possession. 
for example. Yeah. Is that something which you would support or would you see things in a different way? I think that's a brilliant idea, as a matter of fact. And I think that there's people within the uh, criminal justice services that share that view. I think that, yeah, you've got to appropriate these resources from somewhere. And, and, and this has already been brought up, mate, in here. It's like that it's not... Penalising people for the possession of drugs is yeah costly and expensive. Several, like a, a good number of times I was arrested was, was simply for possession, and the administrative cost of that yeah would be better spent I think on education and addressing uh, and, and, and treatment. I think that would be a very very sensible use of those redirected funds. Mr. Summers. Mr. Summers. I feel like I'm at school now because I've forgotten the question. Like, do you think instead of nicking people for possession, oh, yeah. I should stick it into treatment and, and uh, education? Thank you for that translation, <laughs> Mr. Bryant. <laughs> Mr. Summers. I think um, there's an awful lot of money wasted on small time possession of small amounts of drugs, which are just part and parcel of the daily hustle and bustle of using. I think there is an awful lot of police time wasted on that. And I'm not saying that we should legalise it, but I think if we could get rid of some of that because it, that sort of just minor possession is just part of the everyday life of being an addict and uh, you know it would be I certainly think there's a massive difference between decriminalizing and legalizing I think it's good to treat it as a health issue rather than a criminal issue but I'm not in favor of legalizing things but I think we do waste a lot of money unfortunately on money you spent quite a lot of time in prison on I did. accounts of possession yes, I did uh, but also armed robbery to I get drugs I think Nicola so Black would <laughs> trust you Mr. Brown, I think Mr. N and Nicola Blackwood has a quick supplementary. Thank you, Jack. Uh, there's quite a gap between education and full-blown addiction and yes. um, treatment for abstinence. And in that gap, you have first use and so on. And what you need is intervention during that period to prevent addiction and sort of prevention. And some of that prevention is perhaps first arrest for prevention and diversion programmes. Are you suggesting that we should be removing all spending on those intermediate um, steps in drugs policy? No, I think we should do it better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chairman, I'd like to ask both the, the, um, the gentlemen, what are your views on decriminalisation or legalisation of drugs? Well, Chip's already been pretty clear on the subject. I'm not a legal expert. I'm saying that it's to a drug addict, the legal status is irrelevant. It's at best an inconvenience. If you need to get drugs because you're a drug addict, you're going to get drugs regardless of their legal status. So the more money you waste in administering and controlling that, I, 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 you know, I think it's, there's a futility. So would it. you be in favour or not? Yeah, I think to tell you the truth, yes, I would. I think that there's a degree of uh, cowardice and sort of willful ignorance around this condition. I think a good many people here, like if you think about it, like sort of most of it, we've all, we all know someone who's affected by alcoholism or addiction, and it's something that we increasingly need to handle compassionately and pragmatically. The criminal and legal status, I think, sends the wrong, wrong message. But I wouldn't start banging a drum, drum, as I said before, to make drugs legal, because I, myself, I don't take any drugs and I don't drink, because for me, they're bad. I just think there's, we need to recognise the distinction that certain people have a condition or a tendency that drugs and alcohol are going to ruin their lives. We need to identify those people and offer them the correct treatment. Thank you. So, Mr. Summers, Mr. Uh, Mr. Summers, do you, Summers, do you yes. agree with decriminalisation or legislation? I think, there's a, I think there's a real argument for decriminalising it so that it gets treated like a health issue rather than a legal issue. However, I think there's a massive difference between that and legalising drugs. I think you really find it very difficult to justify the legal use of a lot of drugs. You can't really justify the legal use of heroin, crack cocaine, or any of those drugs. There's no medical or legal reason why people should be able to use those drugs. So I think uh, you would be hard pressed to. I think cannabis is probably the one you could make an argument for. But you wouldn't support the legalisation of cannabis? I think it's the one that is most likely to be the, the, the one that you've got a chance of kind of actually sort of putting forward an argument of justification. I don't think there's any justification Sorry, for the legalisation. Yes, of course. Lorraine Fulgrove has another. But if you legalise or decriminalise cannabis, you're not taking away the problem. We've seen the other end where there is a serious and organised crime issue and the narco-terrorism issue, which ruins people's lives. I mean, murders people, has people, and it causes conflict in countries. Uh, so, I mean... We've I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating the legalisation of cannabis. I'm just saying that if if there was any drug at all that you could put forward an argument for legal, cannabis is the one you've got the best chance with. But there's no. How on earth do you justify 
for the usage of heroin or crack cocaine or anything like but that. Making it illegal is not working anyway, Chip. So it's not like, you know, I just think that there needs to be honesty and authentic authenticity around this issue so that people in Parliament don't look like they're out of touch. So yes. I think it's really good that you're holding this committee, but some of this information is already accessible. Thank you. Final question for Mr Ellis. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just, um, I think you both referred to um, a preference for ignoring what you described as the more minor offending in relation to drugs. Can I suggest to you that um, a lot of the more minor offending leads to some of the more major offending, and that actually what um, one is doing if one was to ignore those types of offences would be to make the matter worse, both for society who is suffering under the uh, increased levels of crime, but also for the offender who would be less likely to learn the lessons of having been arrested and be more likely to to uh, to get worse. Arresting. Let me just interrupt for a bit, because otherwise it's like they're telling us what to do. <laughs> Being arrested isn't a lesson. It's just an ad administrative blip. There's a, you need to demonstrate an awareness of the situation. Yes, of course, in many ways, the disease or the condition of addiction does exacerbate. And if you start taking drugs, it's likely you'll take worse drugs. And if you're taking expensive drugs, you will end up committing crime. But again, mate, what, I need to, what we need to identify is a degree of authenticity and compassion in the way we deal with this problem. Otherwise, you just seem like you don't know what you're talking about. About. Crime. What We've talked about them. You can tell what party they're in from their questions, innit? <laughs> <laughs> what about the victims of the crime? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think all parties are interested in victims of crime. Of course we are. That's crime. what we're saying. We're not saying that they that ignore victims. I think we're running out of time. I have a final question about... Time is infinite. Uh, unfortunately, we have... <laughs> we cannot it run is. out of time. It is. But for this committee... I'm Who's afraid... next? Theresa May. She may not show up. <laughs> Check she knows what um, day it is. Mr Brand, I have a final question for you. It's not quite um, a variety show, Mr Brand. We have... We You're have... providing a little bit of variety, though. Mr Brand, uh, you have... Making four... it more like Dad's army. Miss, Mr Brand, <laughs> you, have, you have four five, four point five million Twitter followers. Oh, yes. And 1.5 million Facebook followers. Having gone through addiction and then rehabilitation, what is your message to young people who want to get involved in drugs? What would you say to them about the effects that it has? My message isn't for young people. My message is for people that have this condition of addiction. If you have the condition of addiction, there is help available for you, and I recommend abstinence-based recovery. I think some people can safely take drugs. I think they can. As long as it doesn't turn them into criminals and, or harm their health, then I don't feel like it's any of my business. You know, so I'm not here to do some just say no stuff. The kids that sung that just say no were all taking drugs in the White House when they were visiting Nancy Reagan. It's a further demonstration of the disjunct between reality and authenticity. Let's have an authentic, truthful, honest debate and some funding for abstinence-based recovery. Mr Summers, do you have anything to add to that? With the work, the excellent work you're doing in your charity? I, I tend to deal with what... I mean, I, I get very muddled in all the kind of legalisation, decriminalisation. What I tend to do is deal with a problem when it exists. And I agree completely that when those people come into treatment, they have damaged a lot of people in the public. They are harming at least four or five other people in their families who are significantly distressed by that behaviour. And I try and prevent that. And I think the best way of preventing that in a long-term basis is ultimately abstinence treatment. I think that's when you stop causing harm to families, stop causing harm to the public, and that's your best chance because at the moment I see people who are not in abstinence programmes still continuing to cause distress to families and the public. Mm. Mr Summers, well, Mr Brown, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your written evidence. Thank you. Order, could we have our next witnesses please? Thank you very much. Cheers. Ms. Skynell, Mr. Brett. Thank you. It's Mrs. Gingell. Thank Gingell. you very much. Sorry. Gingell. Now, um, thank you very much for coming to give evidence. As you know, the committee is conducting a, an inquiry into drugs policy and all aspects of drugs policy. Mr. Hitchens, if I could start with you, you've been quite critical of successive governments, including to some extent um, the terms of reference of our inquiry, because I think you have a feeling that all this strategy does not result in um, government and parliament being 
tough on those who use drugs. Is that your, st- is that your view? Are, are you worried about the way in which drug strategy is developed? Well, the, the simple summary in my view is this, that most discussion on drug policy in Britain today is based on the following false logic, that there has been an attempt at serious prohibition of drug use. That attempt at serious prohibition has failed. Therefore, we should abandon any future attempt at serious prohibition. The truth is, and it's easily examined if you look, for instance, at uh, at arrest figures, if you look at uh, Lord Hailsham's instructions to magistrates dating back to 1973, that this country abandoned any serious attempt uh, to prohibit the use and possession, particularly of cannabis, but also actually of Class A drugs, many years ago. And that we have informally and without admission a system of decriminalization in this country more advanced than in either Portugal or the Netherlands. And that to argue on the basis of that, that prohibition has failed and we should therefore have even less of it, is not merely false and mistaken, but actually unhinged. That's very helpful. Mary Brett. Sorry. The government's overall strategy. Do you think that the it's going in the right direction? Indeed, the new strategy. Mm-hmm. strategy. The new strategy. If they do what they say, I, I'm in drug education, really. Um, if they do what they say and stop people from ever taking drugs in the first place, I'll be absolutely delighted. Mm. They say that they will give accurate and reliable information, and that isn't out there at the moment. But if that's altered, yes, I'm happy with it. It makes a change from the the harm reduction education, which has been in vogue for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 (coughs) years, something like that. Ms. Gagnon? No, I agree that the war on drugs is a, is a, you would like to say reports of my death have been much exaggerated. I mean, this is something that hasn't happened. Um, we have got de facto decriminalisation, as Mr. Brandt said, being arrested is an administrative blip if it indeed happens. If anything happens after arrest, you're even luckier. I think since class cannabis was um, um, reclassified to class B, um, in effect, it, we, all we have had is, uh, is a majority of cases are warnings. So children haven't been protected, there hasn't been proper intervention, and unfortunately um, there aren't the type of intervention programs following that initial arrest or warning that do help children and stop them from continuing. Mm. Uh, Mr Hitchin, you, you've been absolutely clear you're against decriminalisation, but you probably followed events in South America where following the the visit of President Obama, indeed before he visited Colombia recently, the heads of government of South American countries all saying that we have to have a debate about decriminalisation because the so-called war on drugs, and this is where they agree with you, has not really worked. Is there no possibility, do you think, of any form of decriminalisation to try and deal with the drugs barons who tend to run these um, cartels? We have decriminalisation. We've had decriminalisation in this country since the passage of the Misuse of Drugs Act, a bipartisan measure, in 1971, and particularly since its its implementation after Lord Hailsham's speech to the Magistrates Association in October of 1973 when he instructed magistrates to cease sending people to prison for cannabis possession, which has then grown over the years into a reduction of penalties for that drug to to such an extent that the the prime uh, police response to a, a cannabis arrest now is something called the cannabis warning, which doesn't even have your legislative seal on it. It was created entirely administratively by the Association of Chief Police Officers and does have no legislative force, nor does it have any criminal force. Cannabis in this country is effectively decriminalised. Therefore, and, and one could point out further if you want me to go into this, uh, because of some an, uh, an answer obtained actually by Nicola Blackwood some months ago, uh, that the, the actual performance of the criminal justice system towards Class A drugs is not much stronger. So we have a situation of decriminalisation. To argue that to solve any problem to do with drugs, you would need to, do, to, to decriminalise is therefore to, to argue from a, from, from, from a position to say we need something which we have already got and which we have had for 30 years. The huge, the, the huge tragedies visited particularly on, on, on South and Central America are the result of the enormous self-indulgence of drug takers, consumers in the Western world who happily take these revolting substances and, and, and create, therefore, this enormous and disastrous trade, which leads, as we know, to the tragic results which, which we're seeing at the moment, particularly in Mexico and other countries. That's not because of 
of, 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 of prohibitionary policy, it's because of a long-term policy of decriminalisation under which many, many people believe that effectively these drugs are legal. Thank you. Dr Julian Huppert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, Ms. Hitchens, I, I, I'm fascinated about what you say. As I said, you've been arguing that there's a decriminalised policy since the 1971 Act, which actually yes. did the criminalisation in the first place. Um, currently, around 80,000 people in the U UK are, found, uh, are convicted or cautioned for possession of an illegal drug every year. Now, if you think that's a decriminalised policy, how many do you think should be convicted or cautioned each year under your criminal policy? Well, it's not, it's not, well, it's not, it's, it's not the, the figures of convictions or arrests that you need to look at. It's the disposals of the cases when, when, when they actually come about. Now, as far back, I should point out, as, as 1994, John O'Connor, who was a former head of the Scotland Yard Flying Squad, said cannabis has been a decriminalised drug for some time now. Right. That, that's, 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 a, that's a, but that, that, that's, 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 that's a fascinating let's, let's, quote, but it's not actually an answer to my question. No, 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 let's, let's, let's move on to the situation of, of, of cannabis, right? So that in 2009, um, we have, excuse me a moment while I consult a note here to get this absolutely right, because it's very, very important. So in 2009, there were 162,610 cannabis cases handled by the police in England and Wales. That's the latest year for which I can obtain figures. Of these, 19,137 were dealt with through police cautions, which expire after three months and need not normally even be declared to employers. 11,492 resulted in penalty notices for disorder, which is an on-the-spot rebuke, which generally results in no punishment of any kind. 22,478 actually ended in court, and many of them did so because they were only one of several charges against the defendant. 86,593 were dealt with by the cannabis warning, which I just discussed with you, which is nothing. But, 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 Mr. Mr. Hitchens, first the, the, the criminal justice system, if I could just make the point I'm making, the criminal justice system goes through the motions of pretending to enforce the law against drugs, but it does not actually do so. You can possess a drug which is technically illegal in this country. You can be caught in possession of it by the police, and nothing, whatever, will happen to you. And most people know that. But, but, but firstly, we're talking about 162,000 cases, which strikes me as rather a lot. You're saying that, correctly, that 80,000 80, go through cannabis warnings. Um, that still leaves 80,000 who are convicted or are cautioned, and that number has been the same not for cannabis warnings. So cannabis the warning is not a conviction. Well, 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 exactly. It's nothing. It has no legal status. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mr. So Mr. Hitchens, I'm agreeing with you on that. There are 80,000 who have cannabis warnings, round figures, and 80,000 who are uh, convicted or cautioned. You say that is not a proper criminal policy. No, no, um, I'd like to know how many people you think ought to be convicted otherwise. And are you aware, for example, of the European Monitoring Centre, which has looked across Europe and found no association between the severity of sanctions and the amount of drug use? Um, well, again, if you, it, it depends on how you're measuring the severity of sanctions. The sanctions exist to some extent on, on, on the statute books of, of the countries involved, but there are no sanctions being applied. Uh, they're, they're, before, they're, the before the 1971 Act, I think you'll find 21 per cent of persons arrested for cannabis possession uh, were, was, were, were sent to prison immediately. That's a, that before the 71 Act completely changed our, completely changed our laws, the, 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 there was actually a sentence of imprisonment for possession of cannabis, which was frequently applied on a first offence. Now, you're caught by the police, actually in possession of cannabis, and they let you go, and you don't even well, get a record. Around 1,000 people every year are jailed. Yes, I, 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 I would like to come back to Dr Huppert. The very interesting um, s study done by the European Monitoring Centre that he refers to, in fact, not only shows that um, drug use in Britain is much higher than in nearly every other Western Uni um, European country, um, and that problem drug use is about three times higher, but it shows that the criminalisation in the other countries that have lower drug use is much higher. The proportion of people who get convicted and sent to prison, startlingly, in this country is much lower than in the Netherlands, which actually ad adopt quite a rigorous approach to hard drug use and to cannabis cafes that break the law, which they do all the time. Very helpful. Ms. Brett, do you wish to add anything on this? No, I think the other two are 
much more clear. Uh, can I just what say, yes, President Santos actually said on the BBC um, before Christmas that as long as people in the UK sniff coke here or in New York or Paris, we will suffer here. Mm. We all know that. At the moment, 2% of people sniff coke here. People like Russell Brandt would like us to have it believed that this is common. It is still not common. It's common in certain circles. If you decriminalise drugs, the, the chances are the risk you take is the rate of usage would go up to the rate of smoking, which is about one-fifth of the adult population. I wonder if any of the committee have stopped to think how they would feel about one-fifth of the cabinet, one-fifth of their children's school teachers, one-fifth of doctors or nurses, possibly being able to sniff cocaine because it is not arrestable. Mr. Mm. Jill, the committee has actually met uh, President Santos yes, last right. month yeah. and we received the same message from him, but it's, it's good of you to remind us. Dr. Hubbard has a quick supplementary. Yes, I, I, mean, I think President Santos has been quite clear that he would like to have discussions about decriminalisation because he sees it as a way of significantly reducing the harms. He was very clear. Perhaps uh, he's given he up was, on us reducing he was, he was, demand he was, for drugs he was, here. He was very clear uh, about the discussions that he would like to see on that. But can I just ask all three of you, there's a lot of question this area as to whether people look at the actual scientific evidence for the harms, look at the actual studies which are done, and then reach a conclusion, or reach a conclusion first and then look for... Uh, for aspects um, of, of data will support that. Are you all in favour of the idea that you should have evidence-based policy? If we have a brief answer from each, then we need to move on. Mr Hitchens. Well, of course I am. Yeah. Uh, well, Who wouldn't be? <laughs> well, except I, I am, but it, it, it's, it's very abused. I mean, it can be evidence-based policy or it can be scientific tunnel vision. I mean, for example, the methadone trials that um, a previous doctors giving evidence here say this is gold-plated evidence. What do they demonstrate scientifically that opiate addicts like opiates? Um, uh, quite frankly, they, they demonstrate that if you give pre free opiates to addicts, you will retain them in treatment for a while. They give evidence that it minorly reduces their dependency on street drugs. Other evidence shows that methadone drug deaths have gone up dramatically since um, this type of medicine was being used. So. We have to be very careful about what counts, yes. what's relevant and what's translatable. Thank you. Mary Brett? Yes, it must be on, uh, uh, given on evidence. And my particular concern is cannabis. And there's been quite a lot of discussion mm. already about cannabis. And the facts and figures being given out about cannabis are inaccurate. They're misleading. They, in, if, if I talk about Frank giving out things, mm -hmm. uh, the information... There, there are grave omissions in the cannabis information, and the, the scientific evidence is there, but a lot of it's being ignored. And I'd like the opportunity later in the yes. meeting we, to, we have, to tell you. We do about have other questions for you, but just cannabis. quickly, do you think Frank was a success or a failure? Sorry, do I the think the government's initiative? Frank. 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 Oh, um, th there are some very good bits about Frank, but no, it, it's. I mean, there was a, um, a survey in, 19, in 2010 fr by Adaction which found that only 10% of children would go, would phone Frank, would look to Frank. This is the sort of thing that's coming through. And I've had uh, personally very um, negative um, vibes about Frank from all sorts of people. Very good. We will come and ask Thank you further you. questions on education. Uh, Michael Ellis, a quick supplementary then, Lorraine. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, just um, if I could ask, um, Mr. Hitchens, I think you referred to the self-indulgence in the use of drugs. Yeah. Would, uh, would you suggest, would, would you support the premise that actually it's not only those who are being self-indulgent who partake in the use of drugs? I mean, do you accept that many people, certainly when they start out using drugs, are feeling unwanted and depressed and lonely and inadequate, and uh, when, they, when they get into the first use of drugs, and that they need help? and that they are, in effect, victims too, and that um, sizeable efforts need to be made towards rehabilitation uh, rather than just punishment? Personally, no. I think that taking drugs is a, is a, is a wrong thing to do. Uh, I think there's a good reason for there being a law against it, and if people do it, they should be punished according to the law. And I think that if, we had, if we'd held to that, then we would still have the levels of drug use which we had before the 1971 Act, which were, which were minimal. And I don't think drug users should be indulged. I don't think the advocates of drug decriminalisation should be indulged either, as the previous witnesses were. 
Thank you. The other, if I could just quickly, uh, yeah, the others. Uh, yeah. I, ha I have to say I do differ with Peter here. I, 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 I agree with much of what Mr. Brown said about abstinence. Um, I don't agree with his views on the legal status or otherwise of drugs. I do think um, drug addicts' behaviour needs confrontation, and then the follow-on should be correct and it should be supported. But I do think it should be quite conditional on, on a level of, uh, of compliance and cooperation. Um, I think the drug courts in America have been hugely successful, about 3,500 of them, and they have um, sentenced abstinence treatment. Our problem is we do not sentence abstinence treatment, we sentence people to further use of synthetic opiates. Thank you. Thank you. And the way for has a quick Thank supplementary. You, a, a quick clarification from Ms. Gingle. You were mentioning about um, coke use, for example, and how it would increase to the level of smokers if it was decriminalised or legalised, mm. and that the committee should think about that. Mm. We, you know, we have, we, we, this has been a long inquiry, and we have searched all over the world on this, this subject. Are you making the assumption that the committee are in favour of decriminalisation or legalisation? Well, I was worried that you took your terms of reference, or apparently appeared to, and I indeed wrote to uh, Mr. Vaz about it, the terms of reference from the Global Commission on Drugs Policy, which is basically a highly financed um, legalising lobby. Um, and that did disturb me, because equally they had given out, and they were widely disseminated in the press, um, incorrect figures about um, drug use spiralling out of control globally, when indeed the UNODC shows quite clearly that it's been stable. So that did concern me that your direction of travel may have been influenced by lobbies who are very much in favour of decriminalisation. And if that's not the case, I've, I'm very happy to see it. Well, can, I, can I just say, we've travelled to Turkey, to the United States, to Colombia, and we will go to Portugal as well, and we've seen many witnesses. And I think it's fair to say that every person we've seen has given us different figures. So, you know, no figures, no two figures have been the same, Well, it, whoever we speak to. No, but the, there, there's only one. You either have to accept the statistics that are, wild, wild, uh, that are collected and used, and that's by the United Nations, um, and that's reported in a huge report every year. And unfortunately, the Global Commission slightly traduced these, misused these figures, or reported them incorrectly. So, and it was a difference of 30% in the case of hard drugs. So um, that's my only point. And, and you did mention them in your terms, this particular body in the terms of reference of your inquiry. Thank you. Uh, please be assured the committee has not taken a view on any of these issues. That's why we are seeking evidence from the widest <laughs> Uh, possible sources of uh, witnesses uh, and at the end of the day we will then publish our results. We are not under the control of any individual group. Um, as Mr. Steve uh, um, McCabe will show. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I wonder if I could ask Mr. Hitchens and uh, Ms. Ginjo this question. I wonder from your experience what you thought was the most effective way of warning, of schools warning children about the dangers of drugs? Start with Mary Brett. No, no, I want to come to oh, right, Mary sorry. Brett. I was asking Mr Hitchens and Ms Ginjo, Mr Chairman. Well, I, I, I don't claim any particular expertise in what schools should do, but I think if you have a properly enforced law where cannabis possession, which is illegal, is punished when detected, then one of the most important things you will do is you will armour people who are under strong peer pressure from their school fellows to take drugs against that. You will give them a good reason. They can turn around and say, no, I will not do that. I don't want to risk having a criminal record. I don't want to risk never being able to travel to the United States the rest of my life. I don't think it's worth it. And one of the whole purposes of a, of a strongly enforced and clearly set out legal prohibition of drugs is to strengthen people against that sort of pressure. And I think in schools it would be enormously useful if we had a proper law and if we enforced it and if it was seen to be enforced. Thank you. I agree that a st clear statement about the law by people who are responsible would, is the thing that makes the most difference to children. The thing I found most difficult when my teenage sons were growing up was to find that cannabis had been declassified and I had a son at one point telling me it's not against the law. 
I said, well, it is against the law. I think parents need the support of the law in order to be very clear with their children, and being cl very clear with your children is the most effective way to um, um, prevent them using drugs in the first place. And that is my own experience, and it's been borne out by my own experience. Absolute clarity about the law and the, the, the wrongness of doing this, and I think we've lost sight of that. We're very liberal, we're very casual. Thank you very much. Now, I wondered if I could ask Ms Bray, I read that uh, you had said that uh, harm prevention has no place in the classroom, and I wondered if you could explain to the committee what you meant by that and what you think about the comments we've just heard. Well, harm reduction has its place. If you've got a, a, an addict, somebody dependent on something, then you can reduce the dose gradually and get them off. That, that in my opinion, is where harm reduction belongs not in the classroom. You stand in front of a class, you've got 30 children there, 90 odd percent of them have absolutely no intentions of taking drugs. Now, the policy has been harm reduction for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, something like that. And harm reduction assumes that children will take drugs anyway, so we need to use, to show them how to do it safely. Now, we know there's no safe, guaranteed safe way of taking any drug. And the other phrase that keeps cropping up all over the place is informed choice. Now, I hope to be able to explain they're not being properly informed at the moment. And, hold on, we're giving them a choice to do an illegal act. We don't give them a choice to, to pilfer or spray graffiti or anything like that. And the choice in the QCA and DFES guidelines is from age seven. Now, seven-year-olds have extremely immature brains. I don't need to tell you that. And the other thing about children choosing is they're completely incapable because the risk-taking part of the brain develops before the inhibitory part of the brain. So the, the children are most likely going to take this risk. And if you go in and give harm reduction advice to children um, it, and on the assumption that they're going to take drugs anyway, which is rubbish because 30 or 40% of children may try them, but, I mean, the actual use of cannabis in the 11 to 15-year-olds in regular use in the last year was 4.4%. 4 it was very, very low. So you shouldn't assume that they're going to take it. You give harm reduction advice, um, and on Frank there, is, there still is harm reduction advice. In other words, uh, here's, this is the amount of mushrooms that people use. Um, ecstasy, drink water, sip it, all. that's all harm reduction advice. And that sort of thing acts as a green light for children. And I know instances where it's happened. They've gone on to Frank's website, they've looked up the advice, they've taken the advice, and in the case of cannabis it's been removed now, but they've become psychotic. Can, can I just check, I mean I think the statement about the clear legal position is mm -hmm. obvious. Mr Summers seemed to suggest that one of the problems of giving advice that uh, young people might know not to be entirely accurate is that it weakens the whole impact of your message. Do you have any sympathy with that view? With, with not giving advice? Well, he, he suggested that uh, if Sorry. youngsters are told things about drugs that they know perfectly well are not entirely accurate, it may lead to them dismissing the entire message that you're trying to convey. I wondered if you had any sympathy with that view. Well, if drug education is done properly, now I, I was a biology teacher and I taught in a boys' grammar school for 30 years, and I know that if you give them, I, and I've researched cannabis for years now, I wrote a huge report in um, 2006, I keep it updated. I've really gone into this in a big way. And if you talk to children and explain it, in a scientific way, but age appropriate, obviously. Because it was a boys' school, they were interested, of course, in the scientific um, side anyway. And to give them the truth. Don't, don't exaggerate, don't patronize, just talk to them as sort of equals and give them the truth, the scientific truth. They will not take drugs. People get children wrong. The vast majority of children have no intentions of taking drugs. What they want, actually, is good, accurate, really reliable information about drugs so that they can say no to their peer group. Someone mentioned peer group earlier. Kids want excuses. 
I know this. They used to tell me, give us more yeah. information. Uh, parents used to take information away with them so that they could talk to their children. Um, so if you, if you do it honestly, clearly, or are willing to be challenged, have your evidence, then it, it, you're 90 odd percent there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Hedgins, is it your view that if there was a, a real hard-line policy, uh, more hard-line than successive governments have pursued, the um, number of people taking drugs would substantially fall? Yes, it is. Uh, and I think it was the case. Um, it, obviously, the, the, the arrival of cannabis in this country after the Second World War was a, a slow business. Uh, the number of convictions for cannabis possession in the whole United Kingdom in 1945 was four, uh, and, and in 1960, 235. Even in the early and mid-60s, it was only a, a, a level of about 1,000. It is, it is since the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act, which was itself an implementation of, of, of um, Lady Baroness Wooden's report, which was not a call for legalization, but was in effect a call for decriminalization of, of cannabis particularly. The numbers have gone up immensely. In 1972, before the, before, the, before the act had begun to take full effect, 12,599 cases. Now we're up to 160,000 arrests a year in England and Wales alone, not including Scotland. There has obviously been an immense change. Now you can put some of that down to social change, but how much of that social change can you attribute to the legal change and the increasing unwillingness of the legal system and the police to arrest, prosecute, or punish for cannabis possession. I think they have to be linked. The figures do confirm more or less what you've been saying. The 2010-11 British Crime Survey uh, showed, for example, <coughs> that uh, some 2.2 million people were using um, cannabis, um, and um, one in six young people uh, took cannabis. Are you really saying to this committee but if there was a harder policy, a large number of those people would simply stop because they would be frightened of being convicted in, in, in court and go to prison. Well, yes, but you must understand this has been, this has been a long, slow process of, of, of change, which has, has been very gradual. The, the, the interesting thing about the 71 Act is that it contained various mechanisms, including the, the ACMD, to, to put its, its provisions under constant review. And the penalties originally set out in 1971 have been substantially reduced again and again and, until the introduction, I say, without legislation of the cannabis warning after the, the Brixton experiment of the, of, of the early 1990s and the Runciman report. These, there has been a long, slow conveyor belt downwards during which the penalties have been reduced and the police have found it, as a result, increasingly tiresome and time-wasting to bother enforcing a law which doesn't have any penalties. So you couldn't immediately reintroduce the provisions of 1971 and expect a revolutionary change. But what you certainly shouldn't be thinking of doing is reducing those penalties still further and, and imagining that by doing so you're going to make anything better. It's quite clear that during the time when penalties have been reduced, things have grown worse. And to, to argue, as so many people do, and I, I, I name this really the, the, the the Simon Jenkins tendency above all to say over and over and over again uh, that you that you we have a serious problem of, of over enforced prohibition this is failing therefore we must resort to total decriminalization it's just not logical because the facts don't support it so we have not been prohibiting cannabis or indeed the class A drugs during that time so what you would be saying Mr Hitchens obviously you'll correct me if I'm wrong heaven forbid that I should put words into your mouth um, but if there was a, a, a far firmer policy by government, um, what would be the position in effect? Is it the drug war, as it's described, would be won? Is no, I don't, think, I don't think you can win it. It's, it's, it's trying to defeat human nature entirely. But you would certainly have much less drug abuse in this country. And I, I hope that your committee will, will be visiting, if it's tra travelling abroad, Sweden, the one European country which is not generally taken the, the position of, of, of harm reduction and, and decriminalization, either formal or informal, uh, and, and has, as a result, rather lower drug use, particularly of cannabis, uh, than we do or I think than any other major yeah. European country. I doubt if there's anyone here, a certain lot of this committee, and I doubt in the House of Commons, who would have any sympathy with drug taking, I would be most surprised. But be that as it may, 
What would be your response to the view that prohibition rarely works? And the, the, the example which is given time and again, whether it's one which you would accept, is prohibition of alcohol in the States, which collapsed uh, totally. Well, well, there, there is... You would say there's no comparison between the two? Well, you can certainly put those words into my mouth. I think there, there's an enormous difference, for instance, between. I mean, we, if you've got all day, we can get into the problem of alcohol, which I think in this, in this country should be much more severely restricted. I think we should return to the, the 1915 licensing laws, myself, at the very least. But to prohibit a drug which has been in common use uh, for hundreds or indeed thousands of years, or in the case of the United States, had, had never been illegal, uh, and to try and introduce laws prohibiting it. Laws which I might add had exactly the same failure as our anti-drug laws in that they prosecuted supply and transport, but not possession. Uh, so to, to, to appeal to that and say that failed, therefore any attempt to not so much prohibit us, but as to interdict and discourage the use of drugs, to say that because of that one particular individual specific failure in a, in a culture very different to our own, we can never attempt ever again in the rest of the history of the human race to try and prevent the spread of unpleasant, damaging, and dangerous drugs just seems to me to be, again, illogical and not evidence-based. Yes. One more question. Heaven forbid, as I said before, when I should put words into your mouth. No, it please go a, ahead. It, it was a question. Uh, there is another view, um, which obviously uh, I would assume you don't accept, namely that the drug traders, those who, the, the arch criminals, and the, the, they're the, amongst the worst kind of criminals, who do their utmost to encourage people to take drugs, would they not be rather keen on a policy um, which governments have pursued? But if it was different, if it was legalised, decriminalised, and this is the argument which uh, I'm not suggesting is mine, but if it was decriminalised, the drug dealers would be um, rather upset, to say the least. I don't believe so. I mean, for instance, alcohol and cigarettes are both legal in this country, and yet both are either smuggled or produced illicitly by criminal gangs in this country in quite large quantities. Unless you made drugs free of charge and gave them away on street corners, there would still be plenty. And given the fact that a lot of the people who, 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 who like to take drugs are, by the nature of the lives they lead, unable to afford them out of their own productive activity, uh, the, the, the chances are there, will, the, the, there would always be an opportunity for, for criminal gangs. Also, it, it, it is presumably far it, fewer. Well, it's, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, there's no reason to suppose so. And the, the, what, 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 what might, might well be the case is that, uh, is that if, you, if you were to legalise or decriminalise drugs entirely, uh, that you would increase criminal activity rather than, rather than reduce it because of this precise problem. People who want to take drugs are often the kind of people who don't particularly want to pay for them. I want the, the solution we come up with for this at the moment, the methadone program uh, and, and various adjuncts to that, involve instead of, uh, instead of drug takers uh, and abusers stealing from individuals to fund their habit, the government steals from the taxpayer to fund the habit of the drug takers, and we're told that this is some kind of advance. Thank you. We have Thank to you. move on. That's on. not organised crime. I don't know what is. Thank you. Um, uh, Bridget Ferbson has a quick supplementary, then Nicola Blackwood has the final question. Just returning to the area of education, obviously we've talked a lot about illegal drug use, but I'd be interested to hear your views about alcohol and education for young people, because often alcohol is a drug that's most easily accessible to young people and often gives rise to the most obvious harm in communities, such as antisocial behaviour. What role do you feel education has in terms of alcohol and drugs and the linkages there? Well, I used to do uh, the same amount of time on alcohol and tobacco as I did on the whole of the drug. I had very little time, high academic school, very little time for anything like this. But I used to talk about alcohol in the same way and explain exactly what it does to the brain, the body and everything. Um, uh, we went. One thing that used to amaze the children when I talked, I, I did this in year nine, which is 13 to 14, and a lot of them are never told that alcohol can actually kill them. They can overdose and the respiration uh, muscles are suppressed and they can actually die. So you give, again, you give them all the, the facts, the true scientific facts, whatever. Um, you, you throw in a few social things and so on. And uh, I've just approached all the whole of health education I was in charge of in the same way, in the same scientific, factual way, speaking as equals, 
and not patronising, not tying you down to them, and just explaining exactly what will happen. And that has a huge effect on children. If they know exactly how uh, alcohol or drugs is going to affect the body, then they, they, they're with you. Okay. This is just a very small point about this. I think it's, it's, it, one thing that's very dangerous is to link legal alcohol with illegal drugs. They should be dealt with separately. The fact that some drugs are illegal should be repeatedly stressed. And to, to confuse the legal and the illegal drug is actually to confuse the mind of the child. Ms. Jingle? Uh, well, I, I certainly think that um, the idea that legal sanctions have no impact is, of course, not true. And I think the risk of, of removing those sanctions would definitely be a significant increase in use. And as Paul Hayes said to your committee the other week, at the moment, 0.6% of the population use heroin and crack, and it's a declining proportion. That means 99.4% do not. We know that only a few percent use um, cannabis, 2% um, use cocaine. Um, the idea that you would risk increasing use and therefore increasing the demand that would then impact on countries abroad to which we also have a moral responsibility, I find extraordinary that you would be at this point of still fairly low usage but disproportionately damaging usage, usage that you would be thinking of putting the white flag up to use and risk it rising to levels that are something like smoking. I, I find this a very sort of strange um, way to think at all and certainly I think with um, um, with education for children on cannabis, I think the most important thing now is that we should be focusing on the domestic skunk market, which is the pressing problem in this country that's within our power to deal with. We have blithely um, um, stopped protecting children. We know skunk now causes psychosis. We don't know what's happening in gangs in South London and knife crime and what role psychosis is playing there. This is something that I think should be the pressing <coughs> concern of the committee. This is stuff we can deal with here at home. The committee is going to deal with all mm. these issues. This is a long, detailed yes. inquiry and that's mm. very helpful. Uh, Nicola Blackwood is the final question. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, if, along the lines of this debate, more people are being convicted and sent to prison, um, one of the big problems that we have is the wide availability of drugs in prison, which is sort of reported and rumoured, uh, but there's very little sort of solid evidence for. Now, I understand um, the Policy Exchange published um, a report in January which claimed that one of the big problems was corrupt staff, um, in particular um, alleging that around 1,000 um, corrupt members of staff um, were involved in this um, issue, which is about seven prison officers per prison. Um, do you think that this is accurate? Do you have any evidence to support uh, uh, these claims? We, uh, the Centre for Policy Studies, prior to that paper, we also published our own paper um, about keeping drugs out of prisons. There are a number of issues involved that could be addressed. and um, One very big one would be the consistent and comprehensive use of sniffer dogs. At the moment, there, there are not that many teams of dogs. They're laid off. It can be judged when they're on or off. There are so many <coughs> holes in the system for keeping drugs out of prison. What we've done over the last few years is spent more than £100 million pounds of introducing methadone into prisons as the first-line treatment. There have been huge worries that that itself is adding to the illicit currency, drugs currency, at putting prisoners at risk. We should, or maybe you'd like to ask the question, how would it have been in those years that £100 million pounds was spent on um, plugging the holes, whether it's over the wall, whether it's corrupt staff, lack of sniff of dog, lack of control over mobile phones. If, all, if the money had been spent to toughening up all those things, it would be an interesting uh, um, to know what would have happened in prison since then. It's, it's, it's a measure of the moral and legal disarmament of this country in the face of drug use that in prisons, which above all should be under the control of the law and government, we have serious drug abuse. And I think it tells you, probably more clearly than anything else, how far the de facto decriminalisation of drugs has gone in this country, that they are prevalent in our prisons. Yes, Mr Chase Jones, you're absolutely right. Prisons are one of the areas that this committee will look at very, very carefully. And you're absolutely right to raise it with us. Do you want to add anything, Mary Brett, to Nicola Blackwood's question? Not really, but I've got um, a few burning points I would okay. really Could like Could you get them very make. quickly? I have the Home Secretary hanging around in the corridor outside, and I don't want to keep her waiting any longer. So you're putting me under pressure. 
One of the things I, mean, I you could like, you could always write to us um, with these points, but the main points, if you could tell us what they are. Can I just say a few points about cannabis of which course. are not understood? One is the strength. There's a lot of uh, myths about the strength of it. Now, the, the last proper home office potency study was in 2008. At that time, skunk, which is 80% of our drugs, the cannabis market, was 16.2% THC, which is a psychoactive drug, uh, drug. Herbal cannabis in the 60s and 70s, 1 2%. You see, Frank says it's, skunk is two to four times stronger than herbal cannabis. Wrong. The other 20%, you can hardly get herbal cannabis now, the other 20% of the market is hash, which is about 4 to 6%. Now, with this huge um, strength, THC strength with skunk, this is doing an awful lot more damage. The Dutch have just banned any THC over um, six, 15% because they are now looking at skunk as a hard drug, and we should be doing the same. That is extremely helpful, and I think on the other points that you wish to raise to uh, with us, um, if you could write to us, I that would be extremely I helpful indeed. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to call the session to a close because, as I say, we have other witnesses. But thank you very much for coming in, all three of you, uh, Mr Hitchens, Ms Jingle and Mr. Mrs Brett. We may well write to you again, and please feel free to write to me if you think the committee is um, going off in the wrong direction. <laughs> We're very keen to know this because we want to make yes, sure that this is a, a very thorough inquiry um, <laughs> and it will go on for several months. Thank, thank you, you very much for thank coming. You for thank, you. thank you for asking. Order. We now switched subject and we have the Home Secretary. Good morning, Home Secretary. Can I apologise for keeping you waiting? We overran a little um, on our inquiry into drugs. Are there any interests that need declaring that are not on the Register of Members' Interests? I should say that I've indicated my intention to stand for the role of Police and Crime Commissioner. Jim. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Dr. Hubbard. Um, I'm on the Advisory Council of the Open Rights Group. Home Secretary, we originally asked you to come in to talk about various aspects of your work, as we do from time to time. Um, it's now two years, almost two years, since you were appointed Home Secretary. Are you still enjoying the job? Uh, yes, Chair. I did speak uh, when I was first appointed to a former Home Secretary who said he thought that enjoy wasn't quite the right word for Home Secretaries, um, but it gives enormous satisfaction, and yes, I am still enjoying the job. Good. I'm going to start by talking about Abu Qatada. And um, I think nobody in this committee room or in the House uh, can not uh, commend the work that you have done personally. You got on a plane and went to Jordan to see the King. The junior ministers have been over to Jordan. The Prime Minister has spoken to the King of Jordan. A lot of work has gone on. But I'm going to ask my first questions, and the committee would like to concentrate on the issue of the deadline. Because obviously you address the House and you informed the House of the steps that you had taken, and you had the uh, support of the whole House in what you're trying to do with Abu Qatada. The Prime Minister spoke on the Today programme yesterday, and he said throughout this process there had been communications and discussions and assurances from the European Court. And you were asked several times during your statement last Thursday, or rather the urgent question last Thursday, as to whether or not you had any information that would satisfy the House that you knew or your officials knew that the deadline was in fact the 16th rather than the 17th. Uh, I for one don't hold you personally responsible for not knowing the deadline, may I say. I don't expect ministers to have to look up case law or look up European directives. You've always got officials, many officials to tell you. Do you have any email or telephone note 
or letter from the European Court to your officials which will say that the deadline was the 16th of August uh, sorry, 16th of April rather than the 17th of April. Well, Chairman, perhaps it would be helpful if I set out uh, the position from our point of view and perhaps try to explain uh, a little bit about how the European Court, as I understand it, operates in these matters, because well, it is relevant to your question, mm. if I may. Uh, because as the Prime Is it going to be long? Uh, I, there is a number of points that I want to make, and I'll make them as briefly as I can, Please. Chairman. Mm. Because as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we were, of course, in contact with Strasbourg, with officials in the European Court, during the, the uh, three-month period, to discuss the deadline for the referral. Uh, the advice that I was receiving, the legal advice that came from government, from Home Office and Foreign Office lawyers, was absolutely clear throughout that the deadline was midnight on April the 16th, and that advice has not changed, and that advice was based on an interpretation of Article 43 of the Treaty, uh, together with the, council, with the Court's own guidance notes that they provide, and past precedent. Now, uh, as I have already said in the House of Commons last week, I'm aware that uh, there were some, well, some speculations and mixed messages on the Monday night and the Tuesday morning about what the deadline should be. The court officials had always been clear with us in any contact we had that the judgment as to what the deadline was and the interpretation of the deadline was for the panel of judges of the Grand Chamber. It is their determination. Uh, about w whether or not to accept a, a referral. Now, given that I had unambiguous legal advice uh, that the deadline was on Monday the 16th, given my uh, responsibilities for keeping the public safe, for public security, this was an individual, Abu Qatada, who we want to deport, we believe he is a danger to our national security. As you yourself said, there is cross the House belief that this is an individual who should be deported. I decided to accept the unambiguous legal advice that I had been given uh, and to take, make the uh, arrest of Abu Qatada on the Tuesday. And that was also against the background that there was intense, uh, beginning to be intense but press speculation about the situation that we were in and what, might, what moves might be made. And I thought it was operationally appropriate to take that action um, and to... Uh, because I believe that at that stage there was an increased risk sure. that there might be an abscond. Well, that is very clear, because what you're saying to this committee is that you acted on advice, as I would expect ministers to act on, on advice, as I did when I was a minister. But you have 61 government legal service staff in the Home Office, headed, I understand, by David Seymour, and eight qualified lawyers working for the Border and Enforcement Agency. Bindman's have Edward Fitzgerald and Gareth Pearce. Now, they came to the conclusion that the deadline was midnight on the 17th. Danny Shaw from the BBC contacted the Home Office and said, are you sure this was happening? Do you have something in writing? I'll give you an example of what happened today. You were due to come here. Your deadline for appearing today was 12.30. I asked my officials to ring up and make sure that you were going to come at 12.30 because I know you were at Cabinet. In fact, they told me that you would come at 12.40. So I got a note back and I found out who the official was that they spoke to and which official had contacted you or your office. You in fact arrived at 12.35. So even on something that is as relatively minor as that, I was absolutely certain that I knew when you were going to arrive. Can the government legal service and your advisors, not you, I do not hold you personally responsible for this, can they give you an email or a letter confirming that the deadline was the 16th of April? I know all this about assurances and discussions and beliefs, but is there something in writing that we can say to the court, you told the British government it was the 17th rather than the 16th? If not, why did Edward Fitzgerald and Gareth Pearce know about it, and why didn't your officials? Well, first of all, uh, Chairman, as I've just explained, um, it is, uh, the court decides through the panel of judges of the Grand Chamber what the deadline, appropriate deadline was, and therefore whether a referral, that it, an application for referral, is within the deadline or outside of the deadline. We are clearly arguing, as a UK government, that it is outside the deadline. As I say, we based our judgment on Article 43, on the court's own guidance that they issue as to how that should be interpreted, and on past precedent. And I have a number of letters which have been received by the UK government in the past, which clearly show uh, the final date. Indeed. Was, you know, if it was the 18th of uh, January the decision came out, the final date... The date on which the judgment became final was the 18th of April, therefore the deadline expired mm. midnight the day before. So based on past precedent, based on Article 43, uh, then 
the legal advice to me was absolutely clear throughout. Yes. Uh, obviously, I take responsibility for the decision that of I course. took to act. But I did so because of the, you know, as you would appreciate, because I thought it was inappropriate that at what was the first opportunity that the government had to resume deportation, that we did this. Mm. Our aim is to deport Abu Qatada, yes. and that is what we are all of working course. to. And I accept that, and other colleagues will come in on the deadline. But you're still not answering my question with the greatest of respect. I understand you acted absolutely on legal advice. I wouldn't expect you not to. This is a case that had the attention not just of the Prime Minister and you, the whole of Parliament, the whole of the country, and the King of Jordan, and the European Court. So on something as important as that, wouldn't it have been wise for the Government Legal Service to have had something in writing as to when the deadline was? It isn't the case that, for example, if, if Weinmans had applied on the 18th, that the court would have accepted their application because that would have gone past the deadline of the midnight on the 17th. Do you have anything to give us? But, as I, uh, I apologise, Chairman, if I hadn't explained fully. The point is that the decision as to what the deadline is is a decision that is taken by the panel of judges. So you're telling us chamber. that if they had applied on the 18th of April, it would have been in time? Well, the, the 40... No, is that what you're telling us? No, I'm, I'm saying that the decision as to whether or not the deadline has been passed and therefore what the deadline was is taken by the panel of judges of the Grand Chamber. They are the only arbiters. And the court, of, uh, the court has made absolutely clear throughout that that is the case. So that the these arbiters only... are not uh, any individual but that panel of judges. But you're... And on the point about the 18th, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the guidance mm -hmm. and Article 43 yes. suggests obviously that there is a, a period of time within which referrals can be made. Um, but I, I think you know, it is, as I say, up to the panel of judges as to what decision they take in relation to the but time But you were talking about referral. inherent jurisdiction. There is no inherent jurisdiction to alter time limits. If this application had arrived on the 18th, which is why they faxed it over, as I understand it, just before midnight on the 17th, it would not have been an application made in time. It would have been out of time. Then you get the question of inherent jurisdiction. But since this has all happened, and since there's been this brouhaha about this, have you gone back to your officials and said, by the way, in your files and on your email, in your telephone messages, and I've, I've worked as a parliamentary private secretary in the law officers department, every conversation we had, we made a file note of what, we, what was said. In all those pieces of paper, nobody has said to them that the deadline is the 16th of April. You haven't seen a single piece of paper, have you? What I have said, Chairman, is that, and I, I think this is one of the points that I was trying the to make. The answer is no, you have. No, no, that's. that's <laughs> or <not>. have you? <laughs> no, Chairman, the answer is that actually the only people who can decide what the deadline is is the panel of judges of the Grand Chamber. Uh, they are not, so it is not for anybody else, as I understand it, and we've been clearly told this by the court, it's not for anybody else to determine uh, in the court where the deadline is. It is for the panel of judges to determine. This is my So it is question. for both parties to uh, use their, obviously, legal advice as to when they believe that referral to be. The clear legal advice I have had consistently from uh, the government legal advisers from both Home Office and Foreign Office is that the deadline was on Monday the 16th of April. I believe it was right, therefore, given that was unambiguous advice, that I took the first opportunity to act to resume the deportation of Abu Qatada because that is what I want to see. I want to see Abu Qatada deported. I believe we have the assurances now that will enable us to do so. It may take many Indeed. months. We'll come on to the assurances before, in a minute. But um, I but believe that's the Finally, on this point, do. before colleagues come in, um, you obviously, what you're saying is you accepted the advice of David Seymour, Ian McLeod and all the other people in this very, very large team of 61 government lawyers that you have. But since this has all happened and since Danny Shaw rang and said, are you sure this is the right date? Nobody has met and, re and looked through files to find out whether they have anything from the court. I understand your point about inherent jurisdiction. But you are telling this committee today there is nothing on file with a date saying the 16th of April. What, what I am telling the committee is that the judgment about the deadline is one that will be made from, by the panel of judges. There was speculation and mixed messages on the Monday night and the Tuesday morning, I referred to that in, in, the, in answer to questions in the House of Commons, about what the deadline was. But the unambiguous advice that I received then, that I continue to receive to this day, from legal advisers in the uh, government, 
as I say, both Home Office and Foreign Office, is that the deadline was Monday the 16th that is very of April. Helpful. I'm and I believe it was right to act as quickly as possible after that, given the importance of this case and given the nature of the of individual. Course. That is very helpful. I'm now going to call for other legal advice, and I'm going to call Mr Ellis. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. First of all, Home Secretary, can I congratulate you for, for coming here? I, I think this is your third time in, in the last 12 months, and uh, the, your Labour shadow hasn't been here once in that period. But... Um, can I just explore what you've just been saying about uh, the legal advice? Because um, you've referred to Home Office legal advice, Foreign Office legal advice, and you've said that it's been unambiguous. There's also a British agent uh, at the court in Strasbourg. Uh, can you say whether you received advice from the British agent there and whether it too was um, uh, along the lines of the advice you received from uh, all the others? Well, as I say, the, the legal advice that I have received at every stage was that this was... Sorry, can we just clarify, this British agent, is he part of um, the British government? It's, are you saying that uh, it's... It's the a Home British Secretary official at Strasbourg. It's a British official. Right. The, the, uh, Do you know if this British all, official... All of your advice has been the, the same? The, the advice that I have... <clears throat> all the legal advice that I have received has been the same, that the deadline was on Monday the 16th of yes. April. And that, as I say, was based, and I have a number of precedent of letters here, which explain examples where the UK government has been informed by the court of the date on which a decision became final, and therefore the date by implication of when the deadline was. Yes. And there are, there's, there's plenty of press past precedent here that shows that the deadline was on the Monday the and 16th. If, if, if I may, Home Secretary, as far as the past <coughs> precedent is concerned, um, I have a letter from the European Court of Human Rights in connection with another case, where they write to say that they're informing that no request having been made under Article 43 for the case to be referred to the Grand Chamber, the judgment of the 22nd of November 2011 became final on the 22nd of February 2012. And that would support your contention, would it not, that, um, that three months having elapsed, the time was up. The Article 43 in question uses the word within. The, the ordinary meaning of the word within three months implies that uh, the requirement is for the judgment, for the referral to have been made by Monday the 16th of April, on or by that date. Uh, in, indeed, Mr Ellis, and, and that is the basis, obviously, on which we worked. I have, uh, you referred to one letter, I have a dozen letters here, saying which are thing. saying the same thing. I mean, the, the, uh, obviously the periods of time that they but, so refer to. The, the dozen letters, none of them refer to the Abu Qatada case? No, none are, of them Are you going to, to let us have these letters? We can let that you have those, very those, uh, those letters. You, um, but they do make absolutely clear that the date on which the judgment becomes final is the equivalent day, which means that the deadline is the, is the previous day. And uh, it is, as I say, there is, is precedent here. And it's not just that Article 43 says within three months. Mm -hmm. It is also that the court's own guidance as to how that should be interpreted makes clear that that period starts on the day of the judgment. So the period of consideration did not start the day after the judgment. It starts on the day of the judgment. And is your advice still as it was? Um, you're being invited, effectively, to say that um, although the Home Office and Foreign Office and others uh, lawyers advised you that um, you would be within the three months, uh, a BBC reporter apparently didn't think that you should be. W would, you, would you stand by, and are your officials standing by that advice that they gave you, and are you satisfied that um, the British government acted within the required time limit? I, I am satisfied of that. The uh, advice that I have received has been consistent. It has not changed since these... didn't change at the time that there was the speculation uh, around Monday night and Tuesday morning, uh, and Tuesday as to whether or not there was a different deadline. The advice has remained consistent, and it remains consistent to this day. And, of course, it is on... Uh, that is one of the arguments that we have used to the court in explaining why we believe they should not accept the application for referral. There are other legal reasons why we believe they should not refer it, uh, according to their own guidance again, because we don't believe the case that the other side have put up actually fits the legal uh, guidance, Indeed. the guidance of the legal so reasons. So you're telling this committee you've made an application to strike out, have you? We have, no, what we have you've done is we are, not an application. What we have done, Chairman, I, I only said no because of the terms in which you placed that. Right. What no, the please, court, I'm what willing the court to be educated does, on the courts. What the court does is obviously it 
uh, lets the other side of the case know when a referral has been applied for, uh, and it, it is open then to the other side, in this case the UK government, to make representations to the court as to why we believe they should not accept the application for referral. We have set out four reasons. One of those is that we believe it was outside of the deadline, so it was out of time. Mm. There are three other reasons. For example, in their own guidance, they indicate that the uh, matter can be reconsidered if the original decision was a departure from case law. We clearly show that it was not a departure from case law. Whether there were general interest reasons why it should be uh, should be reheard or that the appeal should be heard, we point out why there were not general interest reasons. And there's a third reason that we set out. Very helpful. Uh, Mr Michael. Um, when you were giving advice about the point at which the decision would become final, what advice were you given about the powers of the court to consider an application out of time? I had been... My understanding was that the court was able to... Uh, because the panel, this panel of five judges of the uh, court, of the Grand Chamber, is able to determine whether an application is, should be accepted... Part of that determination will be whether it was within time, that it was open to them to uh, make that determination, and that's why... why uh, so you were, you were advised that they could, uh, that, an, uh, that an application out of time could be uh, made and that the judges could then decide that they were going to consider it? Well, yes, in, in that, uh, obviously the guidance uh, requires, the treaty requires referrals within three months and the guidance sets out the expectation of what that uh, timetable would be, but because it is ultimately a matter for the panel of the Grand Chamber um, for them to interpret the convention, I, you know, I can't rule out that in certain circumstances they might accept a late referral. Is, is there in the guidance any limitation on them in accepting a, um, uh, an application out of time? The, gui the guidance indicates that they should not accept an application out of time. That's a published document. Um, the, uh, but it is not uh, outside of the uh, possibility that the, court, the panel of judges of the Grand Chamber, because they are the final arbiters, could exercise their judgment in exceptional circumstances. And go outside if they the to. guidance. Would they have to give some reason for that? Uh, I understand that the panel of judges do not give their reasons why they do or do not re accept or reject a referral. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has, has the court ever um, accepted a case out of time? Uh, my understanding is that uh, I believe that they have accepted a case out of time. Right. Do you know the reason for that? Would we be able to find out? Uh, I can certainly... In, yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, I'm not finished yet, Chair. Um, uh, because uh, my, can't put what a good I wanted woman. to go on to... You can't was, put a good woman down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to go on to ask... Uh, obviously, this, the panel is not only going to consider the issue of time, they're also going to consider the merits of the case. And can I ask um, what your advice is now um, about how strong the case is going back to the Grand Chamber about the Jordanian assurances... Um, and whether it is likely that they will um, accept the case on its merits, regardless of the time issue. Yes, well, if I may, um, s in a sense, separate those, those two aspects, because you ask about the assurances we have from the Jordanian government. I am clear we Can have very... Can we come on to that later? Can we deal with the deadline now, for the deadline issue? We'll come on to Jordan in a second. The, the, well, the question was about whether or not the... I thought the panel were likely to accept the, the referral. In fact, in looking at accepting the referral, they will be looking not at the issue of the assurances that have been received from the Jordanian government. They will be looking at the arguments that uh, Abu Qatada's lawyers have put forward as to why that should be accepted. Uh, and those are arguments about the general interest of the case, about it being a departure from case law, and an issue around fact, uh, whether or not the facts that were found by the original decision of the court were correct. And our arguments are very clear. First, this is not a departure from case law. There are many examples where, and the issue is whether accepting assurances effectively was a departure from case law. We're very clear that that was not a departure from case law. There are examples where the court has accepted deportation with assurances. Um, that on fact-finding, actually, that is not the a job of the grand chamber of the court to determine the, uh, the, the facts. Uh, and on the issue of general interest, that actually that is not met. There is considerable interest in the Abu Qatada case because of the nature of the individual rather than because of any particular legal issues that are, that are raised by this. Indeed. Um, David, we're on deadlines. Um, David Winnick. Uh, 
Home Secretary arising from the uh, um, question of a deadline. Here we have a person who you consider, as previous Home Secretaries have done, is a danger to this country and should be removed as quickly as possible. Does it occur to you that the one person who's laughing about all this is that particular person arising from what has occurred in the last week? No, I was always clear, and I was clear to the House of Commons, that there were uh, going to be a number of legal avenues that Abu Qatada uh, could go through, which could mean that his deportation would be delayed uh, for many months. I've been absolutely clear about this. I don't think, I mean, obviously he uh, and his lawyers will be discussing their the approach that they're taking to this case as they absolutely should do. His lawyers have acted in the way that they have. The UK government stands by its interpretation and the legal advice that ministers have received about the deadline, and I continue to believe that the deadline was on the 16th. So the comments which have been made that what has occurred has been farcical, a fiasco, and the rest you simply dismiss and say um, all that has happened... Um, you justify accordingly, as you said to the chair, I, about I'm, the date. I, I don't consider it a farce, Mr Winnick, for a, minister, a government minister to take unambiguous legal advice, to act on that unambiguous legal advice, and to take action at the first possible opportunity to, do, to resume the deportation of an individual who is considered to be a danger to our national security. But that legal advice, Home Secretary, has of course been challenged, and hence the second statement that you made to the House uh, last week. Can I ask you this question? I mean, you're not in the business of speculating. I accept that entirely. But those who say that it's quite likely that this person, as you would say, is a danger to, this, um, to the security of the United Kingdom, you want him removed, etc. What would you say to those who say it's quite likely by the end of the year he'll still be here? Well, I made clear in my original statement to the House of Commons, and, and uh, mm. I believe I would have repeated it on, on Thursday as well, that actually it may take many months to, uh, to remove Abu Qatada. But what I'm also clear about, absolutely clear about, is that the nature of the assurances that we have received from the Jordanian government actually mean that we will be able to deport Abu Qatada to Jordan. Mm. I'm clear about that. Uh, it may take some time. There are legal processes. So it could and take it a take year, two years, as the case may be. Well, you will be aware, Mr Winnick, that uh, even if we set aside the issue of whether the European mm. Court accepts a referral mm. or not, and we get to have their decision on that, mm. that, of course, within the UK courts, uh, if it goes through SIAC and the UK courts, there would be a number of avenues of appeal that would be open, potentially be open. And therefore, that's why I said to the House, it could take some time, uh, my phrase was many months. A long-running saga, Home Secretary. Well, uh, what I would say to that, Mr Winnick, is this started in 2001 uh, and that uh, I was very clear that at the first opportunity the UK government had to resume deportation, we should do so, and that's why we acted on Tuesday the 17th of April as we did. Thank you, Chairman. Now, just to follow on from Mr Winnick, Home Secretary, can you confirm that Abu Qatada was released on bail under the last government? Indeed I can. Yes, that did take place. I, I'd like to talk about um, Mr Justice Mitting's um, bail hearing on Tuesday and he said that the Jordanians appear to be bending over backwards to get Qatada a fair trial. Are you therefore confident that the assurances mean that and whether the case will be heard in the Grand Chamber or in the British Courts and will we eventually see Qatada put on a plane back to Jordan? I, I, I'm very clear that the nature of the assurances that we have received is such that we will be able to deport Abu Qatada. Uh, as I've made clear, that may take some time, but I am absolutely of the view that the very uh, considerable work that was done by ministers and officials over a period of weeks with the Jordanian government has led to us receiving assurances that will enable us to deport Abu Qatada. Yes, could I ask, those assurances, which of course you told the House about, well, you looked at me, so I thought you had, Mrs. Ford. Well, please carry on, then. I'm so I mean, the country are united in the fact that they want to see Qatada, dangerous terrorists, removed from the country. But is it not the case that we have to do this under the law, so that when he goes, he is actually gone for good? Well, I'm, I'm very much appraised of the need that we ensure that when we do this, we do this in a way that is going to ensure that Abu Qatada is deported and remains deported and is not, we are not suddenly find ourselves told to bring him back by some court. That's why I have said in the House, and I'm happy to repeat again, I think it is absolutely right that the UK government should be operating within the, uh, the rule of law in relation to this so that when we do deport him, as I am 
convinced we will, uh, we're able to do that sustainably. Mark Reckless. Home Secretary, I, I very much hope that the panel of judges will agree with uh, the advice you acted on. If they decide that the deadline was the 12 o'clock on the 17th of April, is it fair to conclude that you acted on advice that proved to be inaccurate? Uh, well, the, the premise of your question, uh, I'm afraid, Mr McCabe, I would question, because as I've indicated earlier in response to uh, Mr Michael, my understanding is that the court does not normally give uh, reasons for accepting or not accepting a, an application for referral. There are a number of legal aspects that they will be looking at uh, in terms of the arguments. Yes, the but you said reason. in evidence that um, the determination was down to the panel of yes. judges. So I'm asking if they were to rule that the appeal before midnight on the 17th of April was valid, then it is reasonable to conclude that you acted on advice that was inaccurate. Is that a fair observation? No, sorry, I, I was take, perhaps taking rather longer to get to the point of my sorry. answer than I, <laughs> I thought it was quite clear. Have my taken. apologies. Um, and the point of my answer was going to be very simple, which is that, I, I, as I understand it, the court will not indicate why it is that they have accepted a referral, an application for referral, if they choose to accept an application for referral. So the issue of the deadline uh, would not be part of that, obviously, because they will be looking at a number of issues, the deadline and, and, and I'm other I'm really aspects. sorry, Home Secretary, I'm grateful to you for that. Are you telling me that the panel of judges could rule to accept his appeal but give you no reasons for that decision? Is that... Is that I understand it is normal practice that the decision that will come out is, merely, is, is simply a decision as to whether or not the referral has been accepted. Okay. Can I ask one last thing? Have you had any advice from your officials on whether or not Abu Qatada would be in a position to sue the British government if this appeal is upheld? Uh, the advice that I've received, the position that, uh, that I, as far as I'm aware and that I have been advised, is that we acted entirely properly. It was entirely within our rights to act in the way that we did on the, uh, on the Tuesday in terms of the arrest and taking him before SIAC. Thank you. Mark Brackers. Home Secretary, you have uh, repeatedly said that you would be breaking the law were you just to deport Katada. How? Well, in a number of ways, uh, uh, Mr. Reckless. I mean, first of all, it, the UK government abides by its international treaties, and we do not break those international treaties. Uh, that's why we and we abide by the Article 39, uh, Rule 39, that was given by the European Court, which has prevented was an injunction on the deportation of Abu Qatar. Can you confirm that that Rule 39 injunction has no effect in UK law? What I can confirm is that this UK government operates according to the uh, rule of law. It operates according to its international treaties. That is part of that. But there is a second part to my answer, if I may, before you, if you're before about to come back no, into it. If before, it is, if before no. we go on to that, we could deal with this international law point, because there is concern that you may be putting an intergovernmental agreement with the Council of Europe before the law of the land is determined by Parliament and our highest court. And you told Parliament that our highest court, then the House of Lords, now of course the Supreme Court, had said that Qatada should be deported. Given that, why are you putting this into a governmental agreement before the law of the land? Well, I, I, I'm not, and if I can explain the stages uh, uh, which mean that it is... Briefly. Briefly. We act in accordance with international law. We're absolutely clear. This is a Rule 39. Uh, if we were to break that, it would be contrary to international law. Uh, our public policy when dealing with deportations is to respect Rule 39. We make that absolutely clear in public guidance, and we have said that to the court. So our courts are clear that the law requires us to act in accordance with our published guidance and apply such guidance consistently. And that is, that is uh, also clear. And if we were to break that, we could be judicially reviewed on that. But the other point is a very simple one, Mr Reckless, which is if we were to move, if we were to set that aside, if we were to say, as I know you believe, that we should say, well, this is a rule from the International Court and therefore we don't accept it. If we were to say that, um, we have to give 72 hours notice of deportation to an individual. Mm -hmm. I am very certain that the individual concerned would have sought and his lawyers would have sought an injunction against that deportation, that there would have been a point of law to be considered, notably whether it was possible for the UK government to act contrary to the Rule 39 injunction. And at that point, we would not have been breaking 
law as set out by the European Court, we would have been breaking in contempt of court here in the UK. Were and that's U why there are various layers why I say that I believe that we should be acting within rule of law. I know it's frustrating to people. I want to be able to see him deported. It so, takes so, time, but I'm also clear that we should abide by what we have said, that we abide by the international law and we abide by the Rule 39 so, injunction. Home Secretary, I'm afraid you've missed a step there. I think it's clear that the Rule 39 injunction is not binding in UK law and is merely an international obligation, as you refer to it. But in terms of Qatar getting this domestic injunction, which would make his deportation unlawful. Are, are you certain he would, would get that? Is that not merely speculation? Well, um, I, I'm learning rapidly. I think I learned fairly rapidly in this role that um, uh, I, one can never be certain about the decisions that ju judges would take, and that's absolutely right, because it is for them to judge each case on their merits. And that is as true for the, the European court and for the UK courts. But if I may, um, there are, I was trying to set out the various stages at which it could have been the case that the UK government would have broken law. You dismiss the issue about the rule, our attitude to Rule 39. What is clear from our UK courts is that when we're deporting somebody, um, we should be doing it according to the guidance that we have issued. And it would have been possible for an injunction or a judicial review to follow on that and also on just public law principles of fairness. But the the guidance is tonight. not law. And you have said that our highest court has said that Qatada should be deported. Is it not possible that if his lawyers resist that deportation, a domestic court will consider itself bound by our highest court and its previous decision that Qatada can be deported? Why do you not test that so we can get this man out of the country quickly? Well, as I've tried to explain, it is not only the fact that an injunction, there could be a judicial review, uh, there could also be a, uh, an injunction. And the point about the injunction is, the question would be, would there be a point of law for the court to consider, this is, as I understand it, and there would indeed be a point of law for the court to consider. And that's why I think that and it would have been highly likely in those circumstances. Uh, and setting aside what I consider is the right thing for the UK government to do, which is say we abide by the rule of law. Mm. Good. Can we just close and conclude the Abu Ghattada section? I know that Nicola Blackwood has a quick supplementary. The assurances that you worked hard to get from the King of Jordan, are these a letter from the King of Jordan? Has he now written and said the things that mm -hmm. he's assured you of privately in the meeting that you had with him? Is well, there something you can wave in front of the court? The, 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 there, will be, uh, there will be, I can assure you, uh, Chairman, more than one letter. Right. And I think I should make it absolutely clear, because this is part of the, the, of the issue, yes. is that, of course, there have been a number of changes in Jordan, and it is very clear that there is a separation of powers in Jordan, exactly as there is here in the UK. We have been working with authorities in Jordan, both uh, with legal authorities and, with the, uh, and obviously with the government. And... Uh, we have a, a number of assurances on the issue, Indeed. such as where Abu Qatada would be detained. You know, his his um, conviction would be quashed pending a retrial. Where yes. to return to? So the, the whole process. Do you so you have several judges. letters? You have several letters from the king. Do you? I don't, no, uh, I have explained there is a separation of powers. Right. Do you have uh, several letters chairman, from a senior official. Which means that we have a number of pieces of evidence that we would be putting forward to back up our case. But a letter from the Jordanians giving you a letter of comfort that all these things would happen or just assurances that you have we, gained? We have a number of assurances that we have received and in I writing. assure you those assurances are in writing. Excellent. Chairman. I just, that's all I wanted to know and you received them when? We have been working on this for some considerable time, and for the avoidance of doubt, Chairman, um, there were further assurances that we wished to receive after the point at which you indicated to the press that we had received yes. everything. I know, I just said that to give you the opportunity of saying that again. We look forward to seeing the letters and the dates of those letters. On the issue of costs, is Abu Qatada legally aided in terms of his application to the European Court? This is a, an issue that is not clear to the House and to this committee. No. Does not he receive legal aid? Uh, you've asked two separate questions. Um, okay. He does not receive legal aid in relation to his application to the European Court. Mm. It is possible for him to receive legal aid in relation to his applications to the courts here in the UK. So he is in receipt of legal aid for any deportation proceedings or any, any proceedings before SIAC? 
Uh, that is possible. The decision, of course, is not mine. The decision no, is course. taken. There are, uh, you know, the, the rules on which that is based are set out very clearly. They're taken by the Legal Services Commission. Um, but that is, that is open to him to receive legal aid. I mean, one of the concerns I have is that I'm sure many members of the public would say, why is it that somebody who we consider to be uh, a threat to national security, who we're trying to deport, is able to access that legal aid? One of the things, of course, I'm trying to, intending to do is to look at the processes that other countries use in deportation to see if there is any way in of which course. we can be able to deport people rather more quickly than we do at the moment. But the cost of the legal aid, do you know how much he's received so far over the nine years? Uh, I don't know that figure um, Would because I know, this figure? I know that the um, – because obviously in recent years a lot of the process has been to the European Court and that sure. does not um, That's privately get funded the, by the uh, legal aid um, hmm. qualification. It is, doesn't qualify for legal aid. Um, but I, I, I believe that uh, the Legal Services Commission would obviously have looked at, he has frozen assets, would have looked at that in terms yes. of any determination so it's a they made. But he has had legal aid and he will have it for any proceedings. He is eligible sorry. to receive it, I, yes. I think. Is, is, that is a matter of the Commission. I know that you've said to this committee very strongly that you have had excellent legal advice. But the committee just draws your attention, I draw your attention, to recent claims of compensation against the Home Office from those very same lawyers who have advised you in this case. Basically, the, the large amount of money that Brodie Clark received in compensation. I know you can't tell us the figure. I'm not asking you for that figure. But it must run into several thousand pounds. You've just had to pay compensation to Sheikh Rahid Salah. No, Chairman, we you have not. Paid. No. Would you clarify? Have, has any money been paid to him? No. None at all? So speculation that he's received any money from the Home Office, this is not correct. No, compensation has not been paid to him. Very helpful. Um, and there are also, in the annual report of the Home Office, a lot of examples of asylum seekers receiving overpayments from the Home Office. Do you plan to look at the way in which legal advice is given to you as a result of all this? Well, well, we're very satisfied that the advice you're giving is, <coughs> is the best advice possible. I you're not thinking of, of asking Gareth Pearson or Edward Fitzgerald to advise the government? I am satisfied with the advice that I received, Chairman. It is the case that there are occasions on which, obviously, as I've indicated, you know, the Home Office will take cases through the courts, and sometimes we will lose those cases, and sometimes as a result of losing those cases, we are, are in the, the uh, situation of having to pay compensation. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that it was the wrong decision to take the case through the courts in the first place. And you mentioned in your statements 15 other cases that you felt were very important that were terrorism related. Are you satisfied? We don't want you to tell us all these cases, but are you satisfied that the processes are in place on all these 15 cases? This is a figure you gave yes. to the House. It, yes, it was. It was 15 cases where we are looking at a reliance on our deportation with assurances mm -hmm. agreements. We have those uh, agreements with a number of countries, and there are a number of cases pending in relation to that. And of course, in relation to the original judgment that was taken by the European Court, mm -hmm. this is of course what has been uh, now challenged by Abu Qatada's lawyers in their application for referral, but in relation to the original judgment, the court found that those assurances were good in terms of the uh, uh, memorandum of understanding we had with the Jordanian government about the treatment of Abu Qatada himself when, uh, should, when he returns to Jordan. Would you let us have a list of the 15 countries concerned? Is this a public document? Or? I can certainly tell you, I, I, if I... Um, I have the figures with me, but it might be easier if rather than trying to find them immediately, um, we tell you which the... There are five countries where we have memorandums of understanding, uh, and there are 15 cases. We can tell you which numbers are for which case. For that which would countries. be very helpful. I don't entertain you. Nicola Blackwood promises me that this is a short question. Thank you. I just wanted to follow on from the points being made by Mr Reckless um, regarding um, Article 39 and abiding by the law. Um, as I'm reading here from um, the Ministerial Code of Conduct, which places a duty on ministers to comply with the law, including international law and treaty obligations. Um, as I understand it, that would include Article 39 um, um, rulings, would it not? Uh, yes, it would. So if you were to ignore that, you would be breaking the Ministerial Code of yes. Conduct? Thank you. That was my only question. Uh, Reckless wants the right of apply. I'm afraid I have to give it to him. <laughs> I'm a very fair chairman. Yes, um, Mr. Reckless. Can you confirm, Home Secretary, that the ministerial code uh, is the responsibility of the Prime Minister and that we have not previously had a Conservative Prime Minister who had in that code any reference to international law? Well, I, uh, 
can confirm, obviously, that the ministerial code is the responsibility of the Prime Minister. I will be honest with you, Mr Reckless, I have not read every ministerial code under every single Conservative Prime Minister that there has ever been. Well, Home Secretary, I have. Why not? And, <laughs> and I would ask you, do you, uh, who was do you, do you agree with ex-Cabinet Secretary Lord Butler, who said that the ministerial code has no statutory force, is neither comp comprehensive nor absolute? Ministers are accountable to Parliament, not a piece of paper. Of course ministers are accountable to Parliament, but I can assure you, Mr Reckless, that if a minister broke the ministerial code, Parliament would have something to say about it. Now, we're going to make rapid progress through the other parts of your very exciting portfolio, starting with um, Lorraine Fulbrook and Heathrow Airport. Passport. Yes, sorry, I'm going to say it. UK board agency officials have said that there is insufficient funding to, to ensure all pass passport gains as staff during the busy periods of the Olympics. And I understand 11 airlines have uh, contacted you on the gridlock during busy times. I have to say I have had a personal experience um, recently coming back from Qatar, uh, which was very busy on a Sunday evening, and uh, there, were, there were three um, gates open and uh, one man on Facebook. So it was, it was quite interesting. And I did ask, why is he on Facebook? And he said, he's very busy. Yeah. As you might imagine, we have put considerable effort into the planning for the for the Olympics, and we recognise the importance of dealing with the uh, with the numbers of people who will be coming through the borders at the Olympics. Um, I think sometimes everybody assumes that everybody's going to arrive on the same day. Yeah, yeah. There will, of course, be peak days, but this it's not the case that there's going to be one single peak day when everybody is arriving. Obviously, um, athletes will be arriving at different times to come to training camps and so forth, and, and games family members more generally, and others, tourists, will arrive be arriving at different times. We've been doing a lot of work with the airport uh, authorities, with airlines, to uh, look at the numbers of people who would be coming through, when the peaks would be, and to roster staff accordingly. We will be at peak times manning all of the uh, desks, all of the primary control points, uh, primary checkpoints as they're known, at the uh, at uh, Heathrow, and we will be ensuring therefore that we have the staff available for that. So those plans are in place. We also have um, contingency arrangements available right. to draw on other staff if necessary. Is there some sort of um, fast track system in place for athletes coming in when the teams come in? There will be a separate lane for games family members, yes. Thank you. It's not just an Olympic problem, it's a problem now, is it not? We've had many examples. BAA and Virgin have contacted us, as well as BA, who I met yesterday, about the problems you have at the moment of people trying to get through passport control. I think yesterday the Bahrain Grand Prix team that came over and, and even Justin Bieber were held in a queue at Heathrow Airport. We're not asking him to give evidence to us, um, the Home Secretary. But, I mean, it must worry you that this is happening now. And you've probably seen the article by Brody Clark, which basically says, go back to the pilot. Well, on the issue of risk -based, a risk-based approach, we've not ruled out a risk-based approach. But, of course, as you'll be aware... Chairman, uh, at the time of the pilot, the initial indications were that it was working. Uh, however, the Chief Inspector's report made absolutely clear that the recording of the results of the pilot had not been good enough. Um, some aspects had simply not been recorded, and we could not yes, rely, therefore, on a judgment and assessment of that. Sure. I believe, I mean, the, the, the primary purpose of the Border Force is to control and secure our borders. And that's why I think it is important that we have the right checks at our borders. Yes, of course we talk to the airlines about the concerns that they have about queues when they do uh, occur. Sometimes queues will occur because there have been other events which have led to a build-up of the number of flights arriving, um, which is outside of the UK Border Force's control. But I have to say there was some um, publicity to the views of the airlines and airport operators prior to Easter, that Easter was going to be a significant problem. In fact, as it turned out, it was not a significant problem. And UK Border Force were able to cope very well with the numbers, increased numbers that they had at Easter, as we coped very well in February with the peak uh, half-term time of school parties returning through Calais uh, uh, from trips uh, abroad. Alan Michael. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, in the uh, letter which raised the issue uh, of the potential gridlock, um, there was an offer uh, of the... Um, Simon Buck, the Chief Executive of the British Air Transport Association, uh, to come and meet you and relevant officials 
in order to highlight the, uh, the reasons for their deep concerns. Has that meeting happened? It hasn't happened yet, but it is being arranged. I can't, I'm not sure whether a date has absolutely been set, but we have been in touch with them, and I'm very clear I would like to sit down with Simon Buck and talk to him about Thank it. Thank you. On the um, uh, Borders Agency and the Borders Force, um, you took a decision to split the two, and we've seen in the figures that uh, of, of the uh, changes in the estimates to reflect that uh, organisational change, <coughs> Uh, that about a third of the uh, costs in rough terms, so therefore presumably about a third of what was all part of the Borders Agency, um, is now uh, separated out into the Borders Force. Can you clarify exactly what the UK Border Agency will be doing in, fu in future and what the Border Force will be doing? What's the, what's the yes. line between the two? Uh, and if I may introduce another body, because there are three bodies who will be dealing with issues around which relate to the border. There will be the Border Police Command in the National Crime Agency. That will be dealing with serious organised crime at the border. UK Border Force's responsibility is to uh, secure the border and operate the checks at the borders uh, that we want to see to ensure that we um, prevent either individuals or goods that we do not think should enter the UK from doing so. Uh, and then UK Borders Agency will be implementing the government's immigration policy. Now obviously there is some, uh, they, these work together, um, there will be times when in order to ensure that perhaps somebody who is not able to enter under immigration purposes, obviously the UK Border Force will be the first port in terms of the individuals who are dealing with people who are coming through the ports. I mean that gives three separate elements in terms of what their uh, focus is. Um, but isn't it going to be difficult to uh, define exactly who does what in terms of securing the borders and the checks and the, uh, and, and the checks that are relevant to immigration policy? Well, work is obviously being done on a, the issues of handovers between these different uh, bodies. But I have to say that in relation to Border Force and UK Border Agency, even when they were, Border Force was part of UK Border Agency, these issues existed as to whether responsibility for certain things was a responsibility of, of immigration officers or the of individuals uh, at the border. Obviously, we're working on the detail between these uh, various organisations, but I think by separating UK Border Force, what we have clearly been able to do is put a clear focus within that organisation, uh, uh, between, within that body of people, on the security of the border. I, I think that's helpful very clearly from all the evidence we've heard. There was a lot of confusion about who does what and how to, to communicate. Um, but isn't uh, tempted to worry that this might make matters worse. It's also very clear that the name of the agency misleads people, even in your permanent secretary's advice uh, or response to questions in this committee. Um, she was changing in her use of language uh, because it's quite clear, is it not, that the Borders Agency and the Borders Force are part of the mainstream uh, Home Office. They are your officials, they're not part of a, an arm's length agency, despite the use of the word agency. Wouldn't it be a good idea, either, if there is to be clarity, either to turn it into an agency so that it is properly a separate body, or alternatively to call it uh, the, uh, uh, the Borders Directorate or something like that, so it's clear that it's part of the, of the Home Office. Well, the, the UK, UKBA was set up in the way that it was in order to present some hand, hands, arm's length um, separation between the Home Office and the UKBA. I believe it was important to bring the Border Force into the Home Office absolutely, absolutely clearly, which is what we have, uh, what we have done. Well, the... the Yes, but this is, this is part of the issue around the structures of government, some of which were set up to try to separate out certain parts from the, uh, from the um, uh, main Home Office. Of course, the home, the home Office family, if I use that term, has, uh, has all of these uh, various organisations within it. And um, um, I'm tempted to say, by virtue of the fact that the Home Secretary appearing before the Home Affairs Select Committee can expect to be asked ask questions on the UK Borders Agency as well as other aspects of the, uh, of the Home Office. Um, by definition, I know where the res ministerial responsibility lies. Maybe you perhaps are clearer than others, including the Permanent the Secretary then, because the confusion of language appears to be there. So, uh, uh, isn't it the basic point that this ought to be either an arm's length agency or understood by everybody to be a part of the department? Well, obviously, the relationships between UKBA as now is, uh, Border Force and the Home Office more generally, are matters that are being... Uh, 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 detailed, if I can put it like that, in the work that we're doing because we've separated out the border force. We, we need to move on. I hope 
Yes, it needs to be away, uh, and we need to. We have had her here already for almost an hour. Um, Mr. Rutgers, you you burning to ask a very quick question, were you? And more than one, um, potentially. On the 7th of November, Home Secretary, you said that senior officials at the head of the border organisation put at risk the security of our border. Our task now is to ensure that those responsible are punished. Have you now done that? Um, there, uh, there's obviously, uh, Chairman, you would form appreciate of punishment, was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were uh, disciplinary proceedings were put into place, and a report was done. Uh, in relation to individuals within the UK Border mm -hmm. Force, obviously you would appreciate, um, and I cannot, uh, there is a, a limit to what I can say in relation to this, but obviously you will appreciate that the then head of UK Border Force is no longer in the Home Office. Can you confirm that his punishment extended to six figures? I am not at liberty to make any comment about the uh, arrangements that were made. And, John and I'm, I'm not at liberty to do that because both sides agreed a confidentiality agreement. And so you have chosen to agree a confidentiality agreement with him rather than to answer for Parliament for the expenditure of public money. But John Vine, in his report, confirmed that Brody Clark told you about suspending Secure ID in his re weekly reports to you, but you did not read these. Can you explain no. why that was? That is not what the Chief Inspector said within his report, Mr Reckless. 4.106 um, is the paragraph. Why, you read the first three of his reports, but not the ones after that where he oh, referred to the suspension you're talking of Secure about ID. The, the, perhaps, Chairman, I may uh, look at the particular reference that the 4.3... 4 4.106. 4.106. You said you'd cooperate with John Vine, but he says he was unable to establish why you didn't get these, and there was no clear explanation for the omission given to him. Why was that not done? Ah, no, that, I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. What he says was that he established that ministers only, receive, only received the first three of seven weekly update reports, whilst the acting chief executive received the first four. We have been unable to establish why they did not received the others as there was no clear explanation for this omission. Uh, those reports were not received and if uh, ministers don't receive the report they can't read it. Okay, so the first three of these were presumably in your red box. Why did the further reports when he referred to the suspension of Secure ID not go into your red box? Uh, that is a question which uh, is, has been asked and uh, I believe that there was some question as to whether the reports received when came to a position in the Home Office where they would be capable of being put in my red box, if I can put it like Maybe that. Maybe we can find out who is the deadline of the red box at some stage. Are we done? Thank you. <coughs> Steve. Okay. Can I ask a, a quick question about policing, Home Secretary? There's been a lot of speculation recently about the West Midlands and Surrey police partnering programme. I just wondered if you could tell the committee, as a Home Secretary, are there any services, in your view, that are not suitable for business partnering or contracting out? And if so, what are they? Well, I think it is absolutely right that the police services in today's budgetary conditions particularly, but in any case, should look to see what possibilities there are for partnering with outside organisations, with business organisations, for the provision of services. What I'm also clear about is that we are not intending to allow private companies to carry out our police activities which require warranted power beyond those, which is uh, detention and escort services, which the previous government allowed to be uh, delegated to or outsourced to private companies. So is the answer any service that doesn't require warranted power could actually be partners or contracted out? Well, there is no intention to allow services other than those I've described, which were allowed under the previous government, which require warranted power to be contracted out. The point of the uh, process that West Midlands and Surrey are going through is that they are looking quite broadly to see what opportunities there are and will then obviously make a determination as to which services it is appropriate, they feel it's appropriate for them to outsource and which it is not appropriate for them to outsource. So I think the answer is that we're, I'm open-minded about this beyond the issue of the warranted power services, um, and, but we wait and see what comes forward in terms of the opportunities that there may be there. And it will of course be for those uh, currently for the police authorities, if it's under the police commissioners and police and crime commissioners, to determine which of those services they choose to outsource. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we're now moving on to surveillance, uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Huppert to uh, take the lead on this. So I noted the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister has given Dr. Huppert uh, the veto over surveillance policy, along with Shami Chakrabarti. <laughs> Did this come as a surprise to you, that you're not included in this holy trinity? I'm well aware of the expertise that Dr. Huppert uh, has in this area, and he and I have many interesting <laughs> discussions, I'm sure, <laughs> ahead of us on this matter. OK, so we have about six minutes on this, please. Miss Doctor, not all of for you, but... <laughs> thank, thank you, Chair. There's a lot to get to. I think the first question which many people would like to, to know, Home Secretary, is what exactly are the proposals? What, what is it that you want people to do that they are not currently doing? Yes, well, that's very helpful, Dr. Huppert, to enable me to say that there are a lot of myths out there about what we're going to do. Mm. Myths that we're going to, in real time, be monitoring everybody's email. We will not. Myths that we're going to be looking at, that that what we're proposing in the communications data uh, uh, proposals is about the content of messages. It is not. What we are doing, at the moment, there is currently a capability for the law enforcement agencies, that is the security service and the police, uh, and uh, they're the bulk of the requests, to be able to access detail about a communication. So how, uh, when, where, uh, not the content of that communication. That data has been used in all secure, in all terrorist uh, investigations. It has been used in 95% of serious crime investigations. What has happened is that as people's modes of communication change and they use new methods of communication, such as the internet and so forth, the cap- that capability, which existed for a certain regime and telephony broadly, um, obviously has not been transposed into the new world. I want simply to take the existing capability and ensure it can be so done Dr. Hull, in the new world. Uh, what, uh, currently you can ask for information from Facebook, from Google, from Skype. And they comply with the majority of those requests. They provide that information voluntarily. What is it that you would like them to provide that they currently do not provide? And what information is it that you would like ISPs, for example, to collect that they do not currently collect? What exactly would this be? Well, the, there is not every or one of the uh, communication service providers will be collecting necessarily collecting the information um, if they don't require themselves to collect it. Um, I want to give a legal backing to the ability of the, to, for those organisations to have that information and for that to be able to access in limited circumstances when it is justified on a case-by-case basis um, by the law enforcement agencies. And the, the issue at the moment is that what we have is a situation where we are unfortunately not able to catch certain with, people with respect, who are doing very bad things. You're not answering the question about what it is that you would expect them to do. You will be well aware, for example, that most of this data is encrypted. Facebook messages, a whole range of other things, use secure encryption. In order to break that encryption, you would need to be able to place uh, black boxes which would break the encryption on each of these ISPs. It is extremely unclear at the moment to ISPs and others, is that what you are proposing or not? Well, I I suggest, Dr. Huppert, that the technical details of what will be done are not... I'm I'm surprised that you say that that it is uncertain to those uh, in the industry what the government is proposing. It is expressly unclear. Many of them have said that to me. In in that case, I mean, the the government has been having considerable discussions, obviously, with the industry about what is happening in relation to these different uh, developments that take place and to what it might be necessary so for the... W- would there, the would there be inc- boxes that do decryption of messages flowing through the network? Yes or no? I, I'm not... I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. I don't think it's appropriate for me in this uh, to, to, to say... It, a, a, it is a technical detail, and B, uh, I am clear about what the legislation will require in terms of the, uh, what we want to be able to access... Um, I would well, say maybe it would be helpful if we had a, another session specifically on surveillance, um, yeah, so which would allow time. us to yeah, do I it. Just, because, well, uh, I've just had a note that you are, uh, uh, you are pressed for time and we have a lot of issues to get through. But it may be helpful if, if we have another session just on this. I, I'm, we could have another session In just on future. this, and I, but I would, all I would caveat that with, Chairman, yes. is that it may be, obviously, we might want to, to consider how that session would be 
yes. held. And who a bears very final quick question to the Home Secretary from you, Dr. Harper, then we must move on. The details, but the principles. You'll be aware that Sir Tim Berners Lee, the creator of the internet and government advisor on, on matters technical, he has commented that surveillance plans would be a destruction of human rights. Do you agree with him? Do you agree that he is an expert in this area and we should listen well, to him? Uh, what I don't know is what the surveillance plans were that Dr. Berners Lee was, mm. was, uh, was talking about, Sir Tim Berners Lee was talking about. What I do know is that what we are doing, all we are doing, is saying we have a capability at the moment. We wish to ensure that we can maintain that capability in the future because what we are seeing at the moment is that people out there, like paedophiles and others, are not being caught, are not being caught because of uh, so the inability in certain circumstances to access some of this information. Okay. We now need very short questions. Sorry. Starting with Mr. Winnex, as you started. Home Secretary, already. the coalition program for government stated quite clearly we will end the storage of internet and email records without good reason. Liberty have sent us a brief, and um, they say for the first time, and I quote, private companies will be instructed to collect information on billions, billions of communications made by their customers. Don't you see that for, for many people, this is a sort of nightmare scenario. And it's under, uh, do we take it that the government is reconsidering or what? Home Secretary? The, the, the proposal that we have is very simple. It is to ensure that we can maintain the capability that has been in existence for a number of years for the law enforcement agencies to access certain data about communications which enables them to catch criminals and, to, and, uh, and terrorists and others. Now, it is my belief that it is absolutely right that the government should say, given that the technology is evolving, we wish to maintain that capability. That's all we're and doing. And extend it we're tremendously. Not, we're, we're not, we're not, no, Mr Winnick, we are not extending the capability. We are in the sense that we're doing anything new other than saying there are new methods of communication and we wish to be able to apply to the new methods of communication what we have been able to do with the previous methods of communication. Thank you. It, is, it, think... it has been there. It has been used. It has been something that has enabled the law enforcement, supported the law enforcement agencies and I believe it's right that we maintain Extended their capabilities. Extended is the right word all right. If I could just ask colleagues if you ask one question, then it would be very helpful to other colleagues. Mr Ellis, no, no long introduction. Chairman, um, can I just establish, Home Secretary, we currently have a system where uh, landline telephones are subject to certain uh, powers. But is it your, is it your understanding that um, there would be a risk that without the improvements envisaged, Organised criminals, terrorists, uh, paedophiles will be able to go about their business more freely by using more modern forms of communication. So, in short, um, is it the intention simply to bring into line uh, with current powers those modern forms of communications like Skype, for example, that are not covered? Uh, Great. It is our intention to bring the capability up to date, if you like, in terms of Excellent. being able to cover more so new things. They, they do not apply. There has been a lot written about what this will do. It will not be doing some, many of the things that has been claimed it will. It will not be in real time looking into everybody's emails. And uh, I'm grateful to all those who have sent me their emails on the basis that they thought that that was what they want, I wanted to do. But it is not what I want to do. We will make sure that is stopped immediately. Mr Winnick, I think, has been communicating with you. No? Um, Bridget Phillipson? Topic. Yes, please, on a different topic. Um, Home Secretary, you may be aware of coverage in recent days of the appalling uh, naming and abusing on Twitter of a victim of rape, um, where, the, where a defendant was sent to prison for that. Um, obviously, I don't expect you to comment on this specific case, but can I ask what discussions, if any, you'll be having with colleagues across government, because I know you lead on the area of violence against women, and whether you feel the legislation as it stands allows the police to deal with this with the utmost seriousness. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to you for raising that. Of course, it is a, a, it is a topic of some considerable concern. Um, I'm not able to give you an instant answer as to where we think legislation should go or whether we think there is further action the government needs to take, because obviously this is something we have to look into and consider very carefully uh, in terms of what the current legislation does enable the, the police to do and the action that can be taken. But I'm, I'm very conscious. Again, it's another example of how with as... Uh, technology advances as communications advance, we see people using those in, in ways like this, which obviously we, and we have to say, are we keeping up 
with our ability to deal with that. Because my concern is that obviously if women feel they may be named in this way on social media, that may deter women coming forward yes. and reporting yes. rape in the future. Yes, I, I fully appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. An equally brief set of questions. The um, issue of police community support officers, there's been some discussion over the proposals uh, in South Yorkshire, although it's difficult to know whether those are justified fears, uh, especially because the actual report is so littered with initials and acronyms that it's virtually incomprehensible. Um, but is it your intention to make any change in the responsibilities and powers uh, of police community support officers, or do you intend to keep them as they are and leave it to chief constables and those to whom they account for the deployment? Uh, yes, it is not our intention to change. As you will be aware, uh, the there are a variety of powers that are open for chief constables to uh, allocate to their P, uh, PCSOs, in, and it does differ from force to force. Um, what we will be doing is that there will be a change to the funding arrangement so that the Peace and Crime Commissioners will be responsible working with the Chief Constable in determining what is going to be right in their force. Uh, it has been the case, obviously, in the past that there has been some funding specifically for PCSOs. Um, we removed that specification from the Metropolitan Police because the Mayor obviously is the Police and Crime Commissioner now for the, uh, for the Metropolitan well, I think Police. That, that's a matter of debate, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway, please, very quick questions. The, sorry, yes. I'm just going to say, in, no. in future, there will be, uh, from next year, Police and Crime Commissioners will have the funding and will determine with the Chief Constable. I'm sure that Mr Mike will be very pleased with that from the South Wales perspective. Mm -hmm. um, three quick questions. Extradition, Gary McKinnon, Richard O'Dwyer. Are you in any position to tell the committee when you're going to come to a view on the Gary McKinnon case? Uh, we have recently received some further representations from Mr McKinnon's lawyers and those are being considered at the moment. And have you looked at the effects of Christopher Tappan voluntarily going to the United States and the fact that he's been held in custody for eight weeks? Are you satisfied with the treatment of, of those who are extradited to the United States and the way in which they're dealt with when they get there? Sure. Um, Chairman, as you will be aware, uh, we, are, we are looking at the question of the extradition treaty, not just at the, the Baker Review, but there are a number of aspects in relation to the interaction between the UK and the US. Um, I am very clear that, we, that it is important that we have an extradition treaty which enables both us to extradite from the US and the US to extradite from the UK uh, uh, those people whom, against whom there is evidence and they should be required so to stand trial. So is there up. a review as President um, Obama and the Prime Minister wanted? There is a, there's work going on on this. There was, there? Obviously this is a matter that was raised when the uh, Prime Minister met President Obama and the, the issues that were raised in that discussion are being looked at. Doreen Lawrence has written to you about corruption in the Met in respect of her case. You were quoted in The Guardian yesterday as saying that you thought this should be looked at. What is your current position on this? Uh, yes, I'm, and I understand there is an urgent question, there will be an urgent question in Parliament today in relation to this, although I will not be um, no. able to respond on it. Um, but the, uh, the position is very simple. There are some, I have been asked whether uh, I should open, whether there should be a public inquiry, Dorian mm -hmm. Lawrence has obviously made her position um, uh, clear that she feels that there should be a public inquiry on this matter. What I have said uh, in response to the letters that I received was that there are certain aspects of the way the Metropolitan Police have handled some of the information around the, this case um, that need to be uh, bottomed out before I take a decision on a public inquiry. So I think the, Gar the Guardian headline suggested I might already have taken a decision. Uh, what I've said is that no decision has been taken, but there's some aspects that need to be considered before a decision is taken. Are you as worried as the Commissioner was when he came to see us last week about I the number of allegations of racism within the Metropolitan <coughs> Police? I'm always concerned about allegations of racism within the police. Uh, uh, whichever force that takes place in uh, and I am pleased to see that the Commissioner and his Deputy have taken this extremely seriously, have put into place a number of actions to ensure that they deal with this and send a very clear message that this is not acceptable. Mm. Now finally, um, the case of Sajid Badat, the Supergrass, um, who apparently has been rehoused using taxpayers' money and given taxpayers' money towards the creation of an office space uh, in his house, and he has access to mobile phones and internets, the internet, and we're paying for the cost of this. Um, the surprise is that this was only told to us because of a case in New York. We were not aware of it. Presumably this is not the first time that you were made aware of it when you saw it in the newspapers. Well, the, the Is the newspaper report accurate? Is that, is that the fact? Are we paying for all this? Uh, what is accurate is that the, uh, as the CPS have said that they've 
they considered very carefully the merits of entering into the, this agreement with the convicted terrorists, but they believed that the administration of justice internationally benefited from the agreement that they've entered into. And I understand that the police have also said it has secured substantial and significant evidence and intelligence relating to investigations undertaken by the Counterterrorism Command, which has assisted law enforcement agencies in other countries. Now, the cooperation of defendants or prisoners with the police um, to, to help catch terrorists or stop attacks and bring other terrorists to, uh, to justice obviously is an issue that has to be considered and looked at in the merits of each individual case. But cooperating with the authorities has been a long-standing feature of our criminal justice system. Now, you occupy one of the great offices of state. You're only the second woman to be Home Secretary in the history of this country. Uh, you've got a very, very tough job, as has been demonstrated by this hour and a half of questioning. Does it irritate you when the press look at the colour of your shoes or what jacket you're wearing, rather than the content of the decisions that you're making? Well, obviously, everybody in politics, Chairman, hopes that they are going to be uh, looked at in terms of what they do and what they say. Uh, but I am very uh, aware of the fact that there are those, not just women in politics, whose, uh, whose footwear is... Uh, uh, looked at by the press from time to time. The uh, Justice Secretary, for example, has had comments on his footwear in the past. And, and <laughs> I don't know whether those are sexist comments or not. I'm sure they're not. Only you would ask um, such a question. Home Secretary, thank you very much. We're most grateful. Thank you, thank you very much. Order, because the session is closed. Portcullis House, Line 2.